Hey strangers, welcome to another episode of the Strange Sessions. I'm Sniffly Krista and with me is Sicky Kurt. <laughs> coffee, coffee, Kurt, oh coffee. Oh my gosh. Yeah, this, it's two weeks and I think two days since I've gotten this cold and it is not going away. And since I got it from Kurt, it's two weeks for me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, everybody has this cold. Yeah, it's just <clears throat> lingering. Yeah, it's Lots horrible. Of, yeah, it's. But yeah. hey, we're it's here. Fun. <laughs> we are here. We we. You're gonna hear coughing and, and nose sniffling. Blowing yeah, and, sniffing. And, yeah. But yeah, this is how dedicated. We I are. might even do the old hork and spit uh, the, the old farmer hanky <laughs> right, right on the somewhere. wall, right on the plywood wall. <laughs> I vote you don't do that. <laughs> okay, maybe I won't. <laughs> Thanks. Um. Weather talk, it is chilly. It's very chilly. <laughs> it was, I think it got down to 34 last night. It is autumn in Wisconsin, and yeah. it's beautiful. The colors are spectacular. And then We're not even at peak yet. No. Uh, with my car, of course, anytime there's a temperature fluctuation of two degrees or more, my tire pressure stuff is yep. wonky. So then I had to stop at the gas station on my way down here to fill it. Do you go to Quick Trip? I think the air is free at Quick it Trip. It is, but they're, it, I, I go to a place where I pay four quarters to do it because i feel like because you're a routine person i'm not a routine person we're <laughs> yes, gonna actually t- we're gonna actually we're gonna that's something we're gonna talk so about I. that's actually something we're gonna talk about in our Ooh. side sessions krista and i were gonna do a side sessions today but krista was super busy this week and we wanted to be a side session that we kind of devote some time to yeah I so i think no for the side session today we're trying our first ever just sit and talk for for half an hour about whatever and you're paying for and that. you're paying for that but some people wanted to do, wanted to hear that yeah so. some people like conversational episodes but yeah i want to jump into our shout outs we have two new strangers and those are two Ga- that's yeah, it that's two it. yep oh. gary allen near and michaela kohler and michaela kohler is remember last episode i gave a shout out to my friend stephanie blakey yeah. That that didn't know I did a podcast and now she's just uh, yeah okay listening yep. to him all the time. We were just she, talking about yeah it in the we pre-show. were messaging okay. back and forth last night before I went to bed and she <laughs> said that Michaela I think that's how you pronounce her name it's M I C H A E L A that sounds like Michaela yeah that seems right she said that Michaela like sent her a text message because she knows Stephanie's going hiking this weekend uh oh don't and listen she, to the she, woods episode that's exactly what she sent her a text <laughs> message she's like do not listen to the spooky like the strange woods stories episode before you go quick side note my coworker Kurt. So to keep us straight, because he listens to the show, I refer to you as my Kurt, and he's Kurt. Yeah, I, I'm your Kurt. <laughs> he's he's running marathons right now, and he this weekend, I believe, right now he's doing an ultra marathon in the kettles. Yeah, and he's like, I told myself I shouldn't listen to the Spooky Woods <laughs> episode, but then he ended up listening to it, and he's yeah. like, I hope I don't run into any. What is it? Skin wraiths? No, uh, what is it? Uh, <clears throat> flesh skin, gates. Flesh gates. Yeah, <laughs> I like mine better. It's way less gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't run into any flush gates. But Kurt. it's funny because that was supposed to be just like a throwaway, don't have time to do any research article. Everyone and loved I it. It's probably our most yes. popular episode this I loved season. It. So maybe I shouldn't even be doing episodes where I research stuff. Maybe we should just be reading Reddit stories. <laughs> right? But um, <clears throat> speaking of that, oh, I got a couple more shout outs. Okay. Uh, they're not in the strangers, but I want to give another shout out to one of my teacher friends that I work with, Linda Haas, who is awesome. And she's the one that smacked me on the shoulder because she was out cutting her lawn when she was listening to that episode and the flesh gate <laughs> creeped her out. Scared her. And her daughter, Ellie, that Sorry. listens to the podcast with her. So Hi, Ellie, I want to meet Ellie sometime. So Linda and Ellie, thank you guys so much for listening. And I want to give a third, an unprecedented third shout out in a row to Whoa. my two of my sixth graders, sisters, Nora and Paige, because I adore them. Nora They're so Paige. different. They're so different because... Paige will run down the hallway and like jump in my arms and hug me <laughs> and Nora's not like that. Oh, but I want to bring that, but I want to bring this up because I thought this was super funny. But one day this week we were out at pack time, which is our recess. That's what we call pack our time? recess. Okay. Yeah. Why is it called pack time? Are you because in we're pack? the wolves. We're the wolves. Oh, gotcha. That's, that's, oh, that's the school cute. mascot. Yeah. So it's pack time. <clears throat> okay. So we're out there and Nora had headphones with her. So she came over by me and ha- asked me to hold her headphones while she was playing so she didn't break them. Yeah. So I'm holding them and then she comes back like 10 minutes later and I kind of have, I'm like kind of hiding them behind my back and I'm like, I don't know where they went. Oh no. And she just gives me a look like whatever. And then she starts walking away and then she turns around and comes back and puts out her hand. And I'm like, what? She goes, give me my headphones. And I'm like, you don't trust me with them? And her exact quote was, you're a man child. <laughs> So then, he knows you. yeah, I'm like, 
I'm she like, at first I was you. at first I was insulted, but then I'm thinking that's the most accurate <laughs> insult I think I've ever gotten in my life. And then and then I'm thinking about that. And I'm like, way. I am. And then Bella is an eighth grader, but she was when I, my first year there. She was one of my sixth graders. She was the first person there that was really sweet to me. Like I'm very close with Bella. And I saw Bella outside at the end of the day because she always comes over to say goodbye to me. And I told her that she called me a man child. And Bella's like, you are totally a man child. She's <laughs> like, you're like a 13 year old in like a grown up's body. That's funny. And then she's like, it's not a bad thing. No, it's and she not. goes, that's why I think we all like you so mm-hmm. much is because you're kind of one of us. Mm-hmm. You know, so I've been thinking about that a lot. And that I guess a man child in the best way. Yeah. But it's like that's been in my mind all week. And, you know, like other people are hearing that. So people are calling people are calling me MC in the hallway. And I'm like, whatever. (laughs) But yeah, the most accurate, the most accurate insult I've ever gotten in my life. Let them call you MC Kurt. People think you have like a really cool side gig. I'll bring my parachute pants and dance around the hallway. Do some beatboxing. But yeah, I wanted to bring up the uh, man child story. Because everybody got a kick out of that. I did. And so I'm... I'm I cackled a I'm, little I'm, bit. I'm, you did, and I'm kind of... I haven't even had any Dayquil. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And just wanted to give a shout out to Nora and Paige, because they're awesome. So well, those hey, are Nora the shout Paige. outs. Cool. Housekeeping. Our next episode, people, yes. is our listeners... Do we have any? A couple. Okay. We need more than a couple, If we guys. don't, I have a couple other Reddit stories that I can always read. There's one. I'll that's... post it on the Instagram. Okay. And if you want to post it on There's one that's a crazy story that I'm going to... It's a little longer, too. So if we don't have enough, I'm going to read this one that I got. I'm not going to say where it's from. Do we have any, like, sitting in our email from a we while have, ago? We like, 50 sitting in our email yeah, from the that last we... five years that we haven't <laughs> That we never to. read or whatever. We but, should look. Uh, I can't think of her name right now, but she messaged me last night asking, is it too late for the listener stories? And I oh, said, no, you have no. like two weeks. So she's yeah. going to send a couple. So Good. between now and next Saturday, not next Saturday, but two Saturdays from now, which would be. Well, but that's when we're recording. So do you want to give them to even if Even if Friday? they send me one that morning, oh, I really? can still read okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys basically have two weeks from. Today. Today, which is Saturday. Well, it'll be tomorrow. I could look up on my calendar, I suppose. And yeah, see because by the time they hear this, it's going to be tomorrow. Yeah, so you guys have until the twenty <laughs> second. Until there we go. <laughs> until six a.m. October twenty second. And that's technically going to be sort of like our Halloween ish episode. Yeah, right? like listener stories. We should make our side session. Yeah. Very Halloweeny because it's going to come out oh, we the should weekend our, right before. We should make our. But then do you want to hold off on the one we were going to do today? Because I wanted to yeah. do the one we were going to do because we're also debuting our book podcast. Mm. Oh, we should talk about that. <laughs> Hello. Let's not forget about that. But yeah. yeah but yeah, I just want to put the call out. <laughs> listener stories. Email us. Private message us. Leave a message on our lonely phone line. Rubber band it to a rock, throw it through my window, something. Just get us a story. <laughs> messenger if you want pigeon. To. I vote if messenger, you want pigeon. messenger pigeon. Uh, um, remote view. You can remote view if you want. Not me, though. Not Krista. It'd be super boring anyway. But yeah, our season is rapidly coming it's to crazy. a close. We have, I think, the listener. Uh, listener stories. And then I think we're going to have one more episode and then the season finale. Really? Well, Hold on. maybe two more. Now I need to look at the calendar. Maybe two more. We usually stop around the end of November, beginning of December. Generally, then, around Thanksgiving is when we end. And then allegedly, there's, we there's may or may there's not. Rumors, there's rumors. There's urban rumors. Urban legends. There's urban legends on Discord and Reddit about a potential about a Christmas, Christmas episode, episode, but we don't know where that's We're coming skeptical from. Skeptical about yeah, that. Yeah, we have our people. We have our lawyers <laughs> looking into the, those <laughs> those accusa- accusations. Okay, listener accusations. <clears throat> listener stories is the twenty second, and then yeah, November fifth. Maybe the 19th. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we're getting down to the <sighs> nitty gritty. Okay. Um, real quick. We have a new podcast coming out. We've mentioned it. It is the Strange Sessions Book Club. If you haven't heard, the first book is The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. We will be recording that episode actually that same weekend. So the 22nd is when we'll be recording that. And we so- haven't gotten a whole ton of... of- stuff from listeners like letting us know what right. you think of the book <clears throat> yeah we have so, an email yeah. so in the next two weeks let us know what you think of the book let us know your thoughts let us know what's going on in the book because i don't even think we know yeah so, we're lost. let us know what's going on i mean i finished it but i'm yeah. still a little lost yeah let yeah. us know what's going on we have a, a gmail the strain sessions book club yeah. at gmail.com we'll put, that, put that in the in i just the... said at clom gmail.com <laughs> yeah we're not 100 like, we're not 100 percent today <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so there's that. And are we going to announce the next book so people have time to get it and listen and listen do you to want, it? Do you want to announce it today? 
Do you want? I think we should. Okay. Just to give people time. Okay. Well, originally Krista was going to do the new Stephen King book. Fairy tale. Yeah. But then we decided kind of against that because we don't necessarily want to make you guys go out and buy it because I went to our library to get it and there's 12 holes on it. So I'm not going to get it until his next book comes out. <laughs> And I like, do have it. I ordered yeah. it from Amazon and I'm reading it and I'm loving but it. But I'm Just like, a... I would rather do one right now that you guys can easily get yeah. in a library yep. or somewhere. But I wanted to do, it was my intention when we started this, that I really want to do Stephen King's book called Joyland. Mm-hmm. It's not a long book. And it's not like a Stephen King-ish it's, No, book there's, like two, there's like two different Stephen Kings. There's like the It... Uh, you know, Christine Cujo, there's like that Stephen King. And then there's the Stephen King that writes stuff like Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. And, but the body that Stand By Me was based on more like non-paranormal stuff. And this is a mostly non-paranormal story. But I really, really love this book. And it amazes me that I really never hear anything about it when people I are I hadn't talking. heard of it. No, a lot of people haven't. But then I'm, I'm when I look at reviews from people, they're like, oh my God, I never heard of this book. And this is like such a good book. So don't expect ghosts and scares or anything like that. It's more of almost like a coming of age oh, story. Cool. But it's it's Stephen King's book Joyland. So that will be the next book we're going to talk about. That'll be the about. November book. Yes. So, so the next one, the one we're going to talk about in the next in two weeks, two, two weeks is going to be the seven and a half deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. Yep. And then a month and then after later, that will be Stephen King's Joyland. Joyland. So we'll post this on social too. Yep. Just uh, yep. we do have an Instagram now for the podcast as well. Yep. What I'm trying to figure out is if we're gonna have a separate feed. Like, should we just release it on the Strange Sessions feed, like the podcast feed, or do we have a totally separate one? I say have a separate one. Have a separate one. Yeah. I say that I ask because it's like double the money. <laughs> oh, is it? Well, it's a it's a what it's a yearly fee though. It's not like it's crazy, okay. and we'll just take it out of our Strange Sessions money. Um. But yeah. Okay. 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 Was that it? Uh, and just that. Uh, wow, next... we haven't even done a taste test yet. And then we're at 19 minutes. Oh, brother. Um, That's okay. We had seven minutes of yeah. chit chat before we started. Um, <clears throat> now should... you're all flabbergasted. I'm all flabbergasted. <laughs> I, just, I also wanted to say, I, I like posted that video in the group with the, the Irish people try stuff. And I didn't realize so many people watch that youtube oh, channel. channel yeah everybody's like yeah i saw this already and i was like, like dang I, I, I just this. stumbled across it i didn't know but my goal my mission for the next season is to try something durian because i've okay. always yeah. wanted to try i've heard it's like the most god-awful smelling but also at the same time it tastes good yeah but it's the most god-awful smelling thing like on the face of the earth and, and <laughs> i remember it's us like, joking about that in an episode that's in our bloopers that's in our okay. bloopers reel where we talk about going to somebody's house and using their knife like, to cut the durian so rude yeah why did you just drop <laughs> yep. butt so in that here. is my mission for next season is for us to try something durian related okay. i know tom napier hinted that he might be sending us something oh, okay so save it for next season yeah though. save it for next season but we want to try that so speaking of that, should we jump into a taste test? Let's do do we it. even know what we're going to taste? No idea. All right. We I know we have something from Coleman still. And we still have Norway and stuff from Mexico. Yes. That looks like those look like dryer sheets. <laughs> they do look like dryer sheets. <laughs> Let's eat the dryer sheets. Ooh. You can try those. I can see the picture. It looks good. Okay. It's called Gan Gancito? This is from Coleman? Yeah. No, I think so. Right? Yeah, Coleman. Yeah, okay. It's called Gansito. It's a filled snack cake. It has a duck on the <laughs> it does have cover. A duck Let me on take a picture of this. I, of course, once again, forgot to tell the new listeners that don't want to sit through this that you can just check the timestamp. Sorry. Let's open one of our packages we got today. Let's read the <laughs> postcard. We'll open one of them, but we'll save okay. the other one for next time. And Stephanie, we still have stuff from you. But oh my gosh, we're, we're, so much we're kind of holding off Stephanie's stuff to last the rest of the season. Yeah. Because we've told people to kind of stop sending us stuff at this point. So, Stephanie, Ooh. we're not forgetting you. Ooh, Ooh nice catch. that's a good catch. This looks like a, a Choco Dial. Like a, not a ho ho, but you no. know what I mean? A Choco Dial? What's a Choco Dial? It was a, a chocolate covered Twinkie, I think. Mm. I have to stop clearing my throat under the microphone. That's probably driving people nuts. I can edit that out. You do lip smacks You're all the time, by the way, that I have to edit lip out. Smacks? Like lip what? smacks? Like lip smacks, like yeah, like <laughs> really? when you start. Yes, I'm constantly okay. editing those out when you we do a mini mystery. You gotta tell me, <laughs> then I won't do it, or I'll try not to. 
Mm, I'm going to smell it. Oh, my God. It's falling apart. Whoa. I mean, this can't Ooh, be bad. It smells pretty good. It can't be bad. No. We've said that before, but... We, <laughs> we have. This is chocolate and some kind of Ooh. jelly filling. It can't be bad. Yeah, some kind of fruit. And it's like sponge cake? Yep. Okay, ready? I'm ready. Oh, my God. It's messy. Mmm. Mmm. Mm-hmm. Mmm. That's good. Mm-hmm. It tastes like something I can't put my finger on. <laughs> yeah, there's like... The chocolate is a different flavor than I thought it was going to be. But, I mean, it's good. What does it remind me of? I know what you're saying. It reminds me of something. It's really messy. It is. Oh, but it's really good. Mm-hmm. I'm going to give that a 9 out of 10. <clears throat> mm. Mm, that's really good. It reminds me of like a jelly roll, like the Little Debbie jelly rolls, mm-hmm. maybe. It has that nostalgic throwback. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And the box looks like dryer sheets. You're, <laughs> it totally does. <laughs> it. You're right, though. It has like some kind of familiar flavor to it. It has I like can't. a. It has like a wang to it. Oh, Wang? What the heck is that? I don't know. It, has it like looks some like it has, what are those called, jimmies on top? Yes, chocolate jimmies. Hmm. Hmm. It's really good, but mm-hmm. there's like something I'm trying to mm, trying to say that it tastes like, and I can't think of what it is. Hmm. As far as like snack cakes go, this is amazingly this is really good. good. Yeah. Because snack cakes are kind of hit or miss. I have to finish it. It's that good. Mm-hmm. 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 Nine out of ten. Mm-hmm. It's a mouthful, though. Wow. Okay. I'm giving that a 9 out of 10, too. I've never even seen this before. Where do you think you got this? I, I don't know, because it looks like it's Mexican. It kind of does. Read that and open this. <clears throat> Hello there, Kurt and Krista. Greetings from... Sh- oh, Sri Lanka. That's right. You sent me a picture. And no, I'm not Sri Lankan, but rather an American spending a few months in this dreamy... Sorry, I, it's really dark in here, and I don't have glasses on. Do you so want me I'm to like, read it? Should I read it? <laughs> Maybe okay. you should. <laughs> it's going to get real annoying listening to me trying to do it. Hello there, Kurt and Krista. Greetings from Sri Lanka. And no, I'm not Sri Lankan. Lankan? Lankan? I'm not Sri Lankan or Lankan? Sri, Lan- Sri Lankan. Lankan. I think but, it's Sri Lankan. But rather an American spending a few months on this dreamy island lounging in the Indian Ocean. That sounds so it nice. That sounds nice. <laughs> Maybe you can check it out for yourself someday. We should have a remote episode from Sri Lanka. Sure. We'll make that happen. It's quite affordable and easy to get around. Anyway, thanks for all the work you do regaling us with whimsical pots for years on end. Keep on keeping on, Kate. Love it. Thank you so Thank much, you, Kate. Kate. Love the postcard. It is, is yeah, going, I love it. Just it is, Yeah, I'll put it up oh, there. That is going on our wall of cards. Yep. And now Krista can open this package because I'm not exactly sure who this is from. Which package? I think I need my dagger to open this. Usually they give you a handy little pull tab. Not today. Not today. Struggle is real. Wow. I'm amazed that anyone wants to listen to us. (laughs) I am too. Like, wow. You people are dedicated. Maybe nobody does. Maybe just Coleman. (laughs) Coleman just keeps downloading them over and over. Oh, it might be another taste test. It is. So, oh, save, save it for next time. Then. It? Yes. Okay. I'm kind of excited. Remind me to read the note. When okay. Sometimes when people send us boxes, I don't look far enough into the box okay. to realize there's a note. Okay, should we'll we open Coleman's in or should we just jump into the episode? Mm. Yeah, let's just open it. Okay. Let's get crazy. We're 27 minutes in. Oh my God. Seven minutes of those is the unedited chit chat at the beginning, though. Not a taste test, it says. Yes, yes. your mic is still on, Kurt. Shush. You weren't supposed to see that. <laughs> I am all seeing. (laughs) You are. Okay. Let's see. Oh, boy. (laughs) Watching me try to figure out how to open a package is probably just delightful. Come on. Oh, thank God for editing. Maybe that'll do it. That'll do it. No, no, it won't. Oh, maybe. Maybe. A fabric of some kind. Ooh, might be socks. Oh, seriously? Awesome. Yep. People love sending us socks. It makes me happy. 
I want to make sure I don't miss any notes. Oh, there's a note. Whew. Okay. We gotta. We have to absolutely yeah. have Coleman here sometime. Seriously. He's so generous. I he know. has we sent need, us so many things. We need to get him on here. Okay. Kurt and Kristen, closed are some Bigfoot socks I came across for both of you when hiking and camping in the Porkies. Up in the Porkies. Porcupine Mountain State Park with my dad. And I believe his dad also listens. Yeah. I just spilled coffee all over myself. <laughs> it's just par for the course today. Yep. <laughs> it's so beautiful up there. I highly recommend it. Also enclosed is a sticker. Oh, I didn't even know. See, this is why we have to read the notes. Yes. A sticker for the strange seller. As another stranger stated, everything up there is Bigfoot. LOL. But I'm okay with it. You two do an amazing job and are truly talented and entertaining. I always look forward to your podcast. Keep up the awesome work and stay strange, my friends. Thanks. Coleman Doucette, a.k.a. the fellow Scotty. Coleman, we love you. He's the best. Entertaining, okay. entertaining, possibly talented. I don't know. Okay, I'm going to toss you some socks. We Aren't they cute? Of course, they're Bigfoot, and he is <laughs> like are buff. awesome. They are Bigfoot's awesome. Bigfoot's got bulging muscles. He does. He's... Thank you, Coleman. Thank you, Coleman. <clears throat> we need to get pictures of us in our socks during one of these episodes, too. And here's the awesome Bigfoot sticker. It's going to look perfect on our wall. Yes, it will. I'm going to put the note up on the wall, too. Okay. Thank you so much, Coleman. Yes, we love you. Yes, thank you, Coleman. Stephanie, we will get thank to goodness. more of your stuff next time. Like yeah. I said, we're, we're, we're keeping yours going for the rest of the season because we weren't sure what other stuff we were going to get. So we only have, what, three more episodes? Yeah, I think Allegedly so. Allegedly four. Three, three uh, possibly four, possibly but at four. least three. I think three or four. So we should try to get through everything from this year, though, as far as like yes. gifts and oh, yeah, stuff we, yeah, this year. Yeah, we will. So that's why I want to <laughs> okay. hit that next time. All right, let's do this. Are we ready to jump into the topic? We are. Now that we're four hours into the podcast? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Today we're doing another Missing 411 Spotlight episode where yes. we do a deep dive into one of the Missing 411 cases. We've done it with Trini Gibson and somebody else that I can't think of off the top of my head, but we've done <laughs> it a, a memorable couple. episode. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the girl that disappeared, I think. Oh, that one? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Not Trini? <laughs> Not Tr Trini's the one that I remember. And it's weird because this, there's a couple tie-ins. So today we're going to be talking about Dennis Martin. And Dennis Martin is actually one of the, I think he was like one of the first Missing 411. Oh. So he's kind of like a gateway for people to find Missing 411. Okay. And lately it's been popular because there are videos on TikTok about him missing where it's more or less about one of the theories that we're going to talk about, which is kind of a dumb theory. But anyway, we're going to talk about that. Okay. But we're going to look into the case of Dennis Martin today. I know we did bring it up in one of our Missing 411 podcasts, but here we're going to give it like the full episode treatment and talk about everything we can talk about. Was he in the haunted Missing 411? I don't, haunted? Okay. I don't remember, but I do know we talked about him because you remember some of this stuff. Okay. So Dennis Martin. Okay, and here's I'm trying something different here. Instead of like what? trying, yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> instead of trying to say where everything came from when I read it, I'm reading a big list of where I got a lot of this stuff from At the right beginning? now. Yep, that's what so, I do on my mini mysteries. A lot of this stuff came from a January 23rd, 2022 article on all that is interesting called "Quote Inside the Disappearance of Dennis Martin, the Six Year Old Who Vanished in the Smoky Mountains." Uh, more of it comes from the June 10th, 2017 article on Mysterious Universe called, quote, Some Very Strange Information on the Bizarre Vanishing of Dennis Martin, and another article on Mysterious Universe from June 18th, 2019 called, quote, The Disappearance of Dennis Lloyd Martin, 50 Years Later. And a lot of this stuff also came from, and I'm just going to tell you right now, go listen to this because this podcast is like 100 times better than ours. <laughs> but a lot of it came from, I thought it was Mika Hanks, but I believe it's Micah Hanks. Micah Hanks. Micah Hanks. Okay. Micah Hanks' website and podcast called The Graylian Report. I've never heard of his podcast. Her? His? His. Okay. Yep, Micah Hanks. It is called Dennis Lloyd Martin. 50 years ago, this boy vanished in the Great Smoky Mountains. And I also listened to a Southern Mysteries podcast on the disappearance of Dennis Martin. And a lot of this comes from a, one of the theories specifically comes from a, a 6, June, June 28th, 2022 article on the Smokies.com called, quote, Feral Humans in the Smoky Mountains. What happened to Dennis Martin? Some of it came from the, the Texas Cryptid Hunter blog. And a lot of it came from two PDF documents. One is the Dennis Martin case study and one is the Dennis Martin disappearance case file. Hmm. So wow. I've been busy the last two weeks looking, working on this stuff. So here we go. 
On June 13th, 1969, like a little over one year before I was born, on June 13th, 1969, 33-year-old William Martin, his two sons, 9-year-old Douglas and 6-year-old Dennis, and his father, Clyde, headed out on a camping trip. It was Father's Day weekend, and the family planned to hike through the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The hiking and camping trip was part of an annual Father's Day tradition that went back many decades. This trip was to be young Dennis's first overnight camping trip with his family. And it makes it even sadder that that's like the first one he ever went on. It's interesting right off the bat that this is such an old case. It yeah. seems like so many of the missing 411s are actually more current. Yeah, more this, is, this is one of the older ones. Okay. The family ended up being joined by another family, which was that of Carter Martin, Ph.D., a teacher from Huntsville, Alabama. There is some question over whether the two families were related because they had the same last name, Martin, right. but most sources say that it was just a coincidence. <laughs> That's a very common But one. others refer to him as possibly a distant cousin, so it's like nobody really knows. But for Does the it most matter part, either? Yeah, for yeah. the most part, it's believed that it was just a coincidence. Okay. Carter, like William Martin, brought along his two sons, and the group's journey began along the Anthony Creek Trail, which families today still use when entering the park. From there, the Martin families made their way up through the steep mountains along the Russell Field Trail, which took them all the way to the Russell Creek Shelter, where they spent their first night on the mountain. The shelter still appears today very much as it did in 1969. Oh, and here's a, something you're going to recognize. And families still routinely use the spot for overnight camping along the Appalachian Trail on their way to destinations like Klingman's Dome. Oh, yeah. Klingman's Dome is where they thought Trini Gibson was possibly right. held for yeah. a little while before she vanished. So it's, we it's weird close. that it's like in the same yeah. general area. Okay. The Martins awoke the following morning and packing up their gear, they made the short 2.9 mile hike along the Appalachian Trail to Spence Field Shelter, where they met Clyde's brothers, Bob Doyle Hughes, H-U-S-E, and their sister Irma, who were also joined by members of their families and had arrived at Spence Field the day before. So there's quite a little gathering there of people. Yeah. The small meadow where the newly built shelter stood much have looked much like it did decades earlier when their ancestors came this way on their yearly cattle runs. Thick beds of grass, grass, <laughs> thick beds of grass, lush mountain laurel, and blueberry bushes covered the small area of Spence Field between the shelter and the adjacent Appalachian Trail. And as an aside, one thing that frustrates me with this is like the podcast, Micah Hanks podcast, they talked like he went there. They went there for reasons that we'll get into. Okay. Uh, but he says it is not like you picture it. Like when you hear uh, a field, you think of like this beautiful big field. And he said, it's really not like that. Okay. You know, it's like smaller. It's, it's Do you not. you take pictures? I think so. Okay. And you know, you hear about this trail that they're walking on, but he said it's almost not, you, you in your head, you picture like this nice paved trail and it's not. He says it's kind of rugged. Oh, so, the Appalachian yeah, Trail is like that. Yeah, yeah, but like the trails that they were walking on. So he says you always have like an inaccurate picture in mm. your mind of what this area looks like. Okay. So I tried to find as many pictures as I could. So if you if you do a Google search on Spence Field in the in the Smoky Mountain National Park, you'll see pictures of it. So Dennis Martin, six year old Dennis Martin, set off that day on the hike wearing a red T shirt. The youngest in his family, Dennis, must have been excited to go on the annual Father's Day hike in the Smoky Mountains for his first time. Dennis had some mild learning disabilities. He was enrolled in a special education school. But the only thing that I stumbled across talking about this said he was a half year behind in his development. Oh. Which isn't that bad? No, I wouldn't think so. You know, but I couldn't find a whole lot about that. So after meeting up with the other family at Spence Field, Dennis and his brother split off with two other boys to play together. As the adults sat out on the grass chatting and after a late lunch, Dennis, his brother, and two other boys on the trip thought it would be funny to play a prank on their parents. We knew what they were doing, William Martin, his father, would later remember. The boys were huddling like football players some distance away, planning how they could move in opposite directions around the edges of the field and come across behind the adults in a surprise attack. <laughs> William recalled that Dennis had been elected to travel alone by himself because they thought the red t-shirt he was wearing would spoil their plan. So while the others headed off to the south, they sent Dennis running in the direction of the Appalachian Trail, the same route that the families had traveled in on earlier that day. 
It was now almost 4.30 p.m., and the elder, the, the, the dads, the Martins, the two dads, watched as the red-shirted conspirator moved up the trail alone, his father and grandfather chuckling about the, quote, surprise that awaited them. So they're watching, you know, the kids are, like, trying to be sneaky, and, and they, they see Dennis go off towards the trail by himself. Soon, it's, it's funny and cute, except you know it's not going to end gonna well, happen. so it's sad. Yeah, but there's a lot of discrepancies about exactly where he goes. Some say that he goes behind a bush. Some say that he walks into the trees. Some say that he walks onto the trail. Hmm. Uh, but soon the boys jumped out laughing, but Dennis was no longer with them. As the minutes ticked by, William knew that something was wrong. He began calling for Dennis, confident that the boy would respond, but there was no answer. According to the official National Park Service report, William Martin said that, quote, between three to five minutes after last seeing Dennis, he became concerned and began calling for the boy. So it's only three to five minutes since they saw him walk off that they started calling for him. And that's not a lot of time. No. Moments later, the others were calling for him as well. And the adults began to move up the hill in the direction that Dennis was last seen. William Martin began to jog westbound along the Appalachian Trail, running approximately one mile before turning around and returning to the Spence Field shelter, hoping that Dennis had come back. There was still no sign of the boy. So he left again, this time running the complete 2.9 miles to the Russell Field shelter where they had camped the night before. While William searched the Appalachian Trail, his father Clyde headed the short distance in the opposite direction along the Appalachian Trail down to where it intersected with the Boat Mountain Trail, which winds for almost two miles back down the mountain and eventually rejoins the Anthony Creek Trail, which leads to Cades Cove. On arrival, Clyde notified park rangers at approximately 8.30 p.m. that Dennis was missing. So he disappeared around 4.30. So it's been and like four and a half fi- hours. Yeah, it's been like okay. four hours. Other reports, though, say that Dennis's grandfather, Clyde, hiked to the nearest ranger station at Cades Cove, which is about nine miles down the trail. Dang. So, yeah, I couldn't get, I get, I got both, you know, but he, they, Clyde, his, uh, Dennis's dad's dad mm-hmm. is the one that notified them that Dennis was missing. Dennis went missing around four o'clock p.m. and it would just be 8.30 p.m. before Clyde got to the ranger station. They had literally just seen him before he disappeared. Irma Martin, Clyde Martin's sister and great aunt to Dennis, later told park ranger Dwight McCarter that the family had only been a short distance from Dennis when he was last seen. McCarter noted in a journal entry dated Friday, June 27, 1969, quote, She recalls that the family was within 30 feet of the child and saw him heading for the Anthony Creek Trail towards the Tennessee side. So he walked off to supposedly scare everybody and was gone. And, as often happens in missing 411 cases, around 9 p.m. that night, a huge thunderstorm hit the area and greatly hampered search activity. An estimated rainfall of nearly 2.5 or more inches. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, covered the Spence Field area in the hours after, potentially disturbing any scent trails or footprints left by the missing boy. Water levels in nearby streams were also brought to such levels that it could have endangered the child if he encountered or attempted to cross one of them. So that just sucks because, you know, it's going to come it's going to come out that the dogs couldn't catch a trail. Sure. And a lot of that is because it was hit with this downpour. But that's a missing 411 thing is. is that after somebody disappears, there's always this storm or whatever that comes through. Mm-hmm. Sunlight cut through the mist rising off the treetops and began to burn away some of the wetness of the previous night as more searchers began arriving in the park. In the distance, some might have heard the Sunday morning ringing of church bells off in the valley where prayers were no doubt offered up by those who had already heard about the missing child in the Smokies. Along with all available park rangers and maintenance personnel also joining the search were the Blount County Rescue Squad as well as the neighboring Sevier County Rescue Squad. Members of the Smoky Mountain Hiking Club also helped and a number of experienced hikers, trackers, and backwoods experts were called in by the Park Service to aid in the search effort. Wow. And we're going to get into the number. We're going to get I was into I going to say how many people We're going to get into that. Uh, the effort that morning, the morning after he disappeared, entailed searches of the drainages down the west western prong of the Little River, Anthony Creek, Little Bald, and Spence Field drainages. Some of the searchers were sent west in the direction of Mount Squires and then down the Anthony Creek drainage where they carefully observed the recent flooded stream beds that could have easily carried a child further down the mountain during the storm the night before. 
Shortly after noon, many of the searchers returned from the first leg of the day's operations, where sandwiches and fruit were provided by Red Cross helpers at the Spencefield shelter. It was also around noon that day that Violet Martin, Dennis's mother, arrived in the park after learning about her son's disappearance the night before. Searchers were also traversing the mountains on horseback, and a group of around 30 Boy Scouts camping at nearby Derrick Knob headed west along the trail that day to lend further aid. By Sunday afternoon, there were two helicopters that were being used to shuttle searchers down the mountain from Spence Field. The search effort only grew from there. An additional two Huey helicopters arrived from Dobbins Air Force Base in Atlanta, and permission was obtained from the 3rd Army Headquarters at Fort Benning to enlist the aid of 40 Special Forces units who arrived later that day. And I believe this is the Green Berets that are often talked about. So remember the Green Berets because this becomes important with the theories. But the amount of people searching was, like, insane. Yeah. So this comes from one of the PDFs that actually is, like, the records of what all happened. So here we go. Immediately after the disappearance, three rangers from Cades Cove checked the area, checked the trails from Cades Cove to Spence Field, and questioned any hikers that they found in the area. On day two after he disappeared, nine jeeps and three trucks are used to transport searchers from the Boat Mountain Road to Spence Field, seven miles away. The total number of search personnel on day two was 240 people. Wow. Day three, a heliport was established at Cades Cove, and several military helicopters arrive. Forty special forces troops, self-contained with communications, are requested. Two bloodhounds arrive and are used during the day. The total number of people involved on day three was 300, including personnel from the park, the local rescue squad, the Air National Guard, and other volunteers. On day four, 50 Tennessee Air National Guard personnel with two helicopters arrive and join the effort. The total number of searchers on day four was 365, including 149 people from 20 different... 20 different county rescue squads, 40 special force military personnel, 50 junior college students who showed up to help, 75 NPS personnel, and 51 assorted volunteers. What's NPS? National Park Service. Oh, okay. NPS. NPS. They said Emma. No. (laughs) On day five, small groups of searchers camped in various areas overnight, building large bonfires in hopes of attracting the boy. Large numbers of predictions by clairvoyance began. Oh, of course. An overabundance of unsolicited food began to arrive, including a semi-truck trailer filled with lettuce. <laughs> so, what? Well, I, I, it's sweet. People are trying to be nice, but a truck of lettuce? Yeah, I hope you like your salads, I guess. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but, but yeah, and uh, 22 more special forces personnel arrived. The total number of searchers on day five was 615. Dang. On day six, clairvoyant predictions increase, and the Martins believe that these should be checked up on. Why not? The media has many of the predictions, and public pressure is heavy to check all of these. All animal excrement found is checked, and buzzards are being watched. The total number of searchers on day six is 690. On day seven, an additional 200 Army National Guardsmen are called in, the total number of searchers on day seven being 780. And on day eight, the total number of searchers, this was a Saturday, on day eight, the total number of searchers that day was 1,400 from 35 different organizations. You have Boy Scouts out looking. You have these college students that have nothing to do. You know, you probably have the the Raleigh Quilting Club out there right? looking for him. How could they have not but found 1,400 him? people is yeah, insane. That is insane. And it's also good and bad because... You have people contaminating, contaminating. Probably, yeah. you have people rechecking the same area, probably not looking at other areas because nothing was really organized mm. well. Most of them aren't trained. I mean, a no, lot of most them of were. The, but, but what we're going to get into this, but the military people that were looking stayed to themselves and didn't really communicate mm. with anybody else. So mm. they might have been doing a good job, but you're, it, this comes out at the end that this set a precedent for how to perform search and rescue operations sure. because this was it was well intended that yeah. all these people came but, but it might have hurt more than it possibly helped in the following days grid searchers were conducted by experienced trackers which combed the areas immediately adjacent to spence field backpacks binoculars and other assorted evidence of past hikes were found but nothing that even vaguely resembled any of dennis's belongings Footprints were found on a few occasions that some suspected could have belonged to a child, and castings were made of these and shown to the Martin family, but they believed they were too large to have belonged to Dennis. 
Dogs sent out were said to be unable to pick up any scent, in some cases even suddenly refusing to continue or cowering in fear. That's kind of weird, actually. And that's a missing 411. Going back to the shoe thing, (laughs) if somebody gave me a cast of Jim's boot prints, I'd be like, okay. Yeah, but if you're an adult... If you're a mom or dad buying shoes for your son, you kind of have a good Maybe? idea of what their shoe size is. I don't even is. know what my treads look like. Yeah. You know what I mean? Size, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Okay. But the dogs, the, dogs. Re- the dogs refusing to continue or cowering in fear is said to be a missing mm-hmm. 411 thing, too. One psychic from Los Angeles called in to say that he had seen the boy two and a half miles to the left of where he was last seen by his father, saying that he had fallen off a steep area and was hung up in the bushes but was still alive. Another psychic from New Orleans said the authorities should stop looking on the ground and start looking up in the trees and treetops. In all, there were dozens of calls from psychics who were convinced that they had answers that could lead to Dennis, and even though they did follow up on like every one of those calls and everything led to a dead end. Despite the search effort that continued on for days and then weeks, nothing was ever found. Dennis Martin had simply vanished. So, But it's just crazy to me that there's... Park rangers, college students, helicopters, members of the Smoky Mountain Hiking Club, firefighters, Boy Scouts, police, Green Berets. And did not find a trace. Did not find a trace. It doesn't seem possible. You know what I mean? It doesn't seem like he was gone long enough. Right. You know, as the days flew past, it became more and more clear that the boy would not be found alive. On Sunday, June 29th, the Great Smoky Mountain National Park Rangers suspended all major search operations for Dennis Martin, and the FBI met with park officials and reported that they had found no evidence supporting theories that he had been kidnapped. Over the next few days, the Martin family raised a reward to be offered for any information leading to their son. The search and rescue effort gradually lost steam with no sight of Dennis Martin. The family did offer a $5,000 reward for information, but in response, they received a flood of calls from other psychics claiming to know what happened to their son. On September 11th, 1969, the park officially ended the search for Dennis Martin. More than half a century later, no one really knows what happened to Dennis Martin the day he went missing in the Smoky Mountains. Theories range from plausible to ridiculous. And we're going to get into all those. Mm -hmm. But one of the big parts of this story is something known as the Harold Key sighting. And this might sound familiar to you when we when I talk about it, because we did talk about it in our Missing 411 episode. Okay. Harold Key was from Carthage, Tennessee. He and his family were in the park the day that Dennis disappeared. They were in the Sea Branch area near Rowan's Creek, about a seven-mile hike from Spence Field. Key told investigators that he heard a, quote, sickening scream that afternoon come from the woods. He and his wife looked around to see what was going on because they were worried one of their children were being attacked by a bear. Within a few minutes, he spotted a rough-looking man moving at a pretty fast pace through the woods nearby, and Key said it was obvious that the man was avoiding them. And this comes up a lot in the Missing 411 stories, but, you know, Micah Hanks in his podcast, he interviewed somebody, I'll get to the, the guy later interviewed, but somebody that questioned a lot of the people involved in this case in later years. And he says it's amazing how the story of this guy being seen has kind of changed. Oh, really? Like, a lot of stories claim that he was wearing, like, a bearskin parka, and he every a lot of the stories say that he had something slung over his shoulder. Some of the stories say that it was red, like Dennis Martin's... All from this one sighting? Yes. Okay. That And that some of the stories say that he, he was carrying something over his shoulder that was partly red, like Dennis Martin's shirt was. Mm. So a lot of people think that this was a wild man or a feral man that kidnapped Dennis Martin. And a lot of people make it sound like a bear type man that almost sounds like a like a Sasquatch thing. <laughs> yeah, but this is like Appalachian. Yeah, I mean, there's yeah. like backwoods but that's, people. That's what a, that's what a lot of these stories say. But we're going to get into. But the it's re- not based on a bunch of people who saw him. It's just this one yes. couple. Yeah, but so it's like the story. Just you know, like changed. they talk about like how it's changed depending on if it's a paranormal podcast. Oh. All of a sudden, it's like this weird mountain man carrying something on his shoulder. But we're like going to get squatch. we're going to get into the reality of what he really saw. Okay, but a lot of this is real. But the descriptions of the man change depending on what your what you're pushing. If sure. You're, you know. Yep, I get it. It should. We're be, just pushing the facts, people. We are just pushing the facts. <laughs> It should be noted that the distance as the crow flies that is directly between the two locations is 3.95 miles, according to Google Maps. The The distance from, from between where he, where he disappeared okay. and where this person came out of the woods and they heard this scream was about 3.95 miles. 
Conceivably, an individual with knowledge of that backcountry might be able to traverse this distance in a shorter amount of time by following a direct path. Dwight McCarter, who we referenced before, park ranger, said that he was able to do this, but with some difficulty. And Micah Hanks, that's what they went out there to do, to see if they could get from point A to point B within the allotted time of the sighting. And he did. He said he was able to, Mm -hmm. but it was difficult. And he said it would have been impossible if you were dragging or carrying a fighting child with you. Okay. And this is the guy's name that he interviews on the podcast. On July 27th, 2016, Michael Bouchard, a researcher with more than three decades in law enforcement who has independently investigated the case, spoke to Harold Key, who was 90 years old at the time of the interview. Key's daughter, Wanda, also spoke with Bouchard. Wanda, who had been in the park with the rest of the Key family at the time of the incident in 1969, would have been 17 years old when it happened. Michael Bouchard gives the following account of his interview with Harold Key and Wanda in his book called Forever Searching, Lost in the Smoky Mountains. So, okay. So how long between when this happened and when this interview is happening? The interview happened in 2016. He disappeared in 1969. Okay. So just bear in mind. And he's 90 years old. Memories change. He's 90 years old, but Bouchard said he was sharp, that he was not. I get that, but memories change. Memories change, and... The more that people are asking you what happened because they think there's something paranormal, missing 411 yeah. related going on, the more you might start to even unconsciously change your story to... Your perspective on it yes. might change. Yeah. I mean, the, people's memories are notoriously yes. unreliable. So this is from his book called Forever Searching, Lost in the Smoky Mountains, where he interviews Harold Key. Quote, Mr. Key reported before walking into the woods with his family, he observed an unoccupied white vehicle parked along the road in the Sea Branch area of the park near Rowan's Creek. Mr. Key said that at first he didn't pay any attention to the vehicle. Mr. Key said that he walked about 300 to 500 yards into the woods and then observed a middle-aged white male walking quickly through the woods in the direction of the road. Mr. Key said that the man was by himself, that he walked quickly to the road, entered the white vehicle, and drove off at such a high rate of speed it threw gravel into the air. The vehicle was seen heading in the direction of Cade's Cove. Mr. Key later recalled that when the man saw him and his family, the man began walking faster. Mr. Key said that the man appeared to be perspiring heavenly... Heavenly. (laughs) Mr. Key said that the man appeared to be perspiring heavily and was acting nervous. Mr. Key recalled saying to his wife, quote, that man, he is thinking strange thoughts, which is a weird Weird thing to say. say. (laughs) Key could not recall the exact time that the incident happened, but noted that it had been likely between 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. So that's a hell of a window of time. Yeah. Because Dennis disappeared at 4.30 p.m. Right. Hmm. So if this had this had to have happened towards the 7 p.m. Right. You know, if it was two, it has nothing to do with his disappearance. Regarding the scream that the family is reported as hearing from newspaper articles in July 1969, Key and his daughter provided Bouchard with further details, noting that in addition to the terrible scream reported by the newspapers, Harold Key also believes that he heard a child scream the word help. Oh, God. Bouchard gives the following account as related during his personal interview with Key. Quote, Mr. Key said that as he approached Rowan's Creek, he heard a child scream help and then heard another agonizing scream of pain. Mr. Key said that after hearing the scream, he walked approximately 200 yards up the footpath bordering Rowan's Creek, but he did not see a child or anything out of the ordinary. Mr. Key recalled that the scream had seemed to have come from a great distance north of Rowan's Creek or up along the mountains, but he could not pinpoint an exact location. His daughter said that her dad was in the U.S. Navy during World War II and was, quote, rough and tumble, and that he would have gone after someone that had been hurting a child. His daughter recalled that her younger brother, Anthony, also heard the scream, but he couldn't tell if it came from a child or an animal. It was the opinion of Chief Ranger Lee Sneddon that the incident at Rowan's Creek was unrelated to the disappearance of Dennis Martin. He said, quote, It's unlikely that the scream Key heard could have been from the missing boy. It was reported, noting that, that the place where Key and his family were on Sea Branch is four to five air miles from Spence Field, and that the distance is approximately seven miles by a route that a person would probably travel. Hmm. So That's really far. as the crow flies, if you're not on the trails, you can make it there. But that's rugged, rugged yeah. territory. I mean, that would take 
a few yep, hours. Comparing these figures with modern Google mapping software indicates that the walking distance between the Spencefield shelter and the Sea Branch area is exactly 7.1 miles, which would take approximately two hours and 46 minutes to travel on foot. Yep. Key also told Bouchard that he was advised by the FBI during those interviews, quote, do not discuss the case. However, an interesting element in Key's statements to Bouchard in 2016 involves the fact that Key said that he also received two anonymous phone calls around the time of the investigation into Dennis's disappearance, which just simply said to him, quote, forget about what you saw in the park that day. Which is weird. It is weird. Maybe... Maybe that guy was totally creeped out by them, and he's like, "Well, I'm getting we're gonna out get, of we're here. gonna get into that. We're gonna <laughs> okay. get into that." So I just want to end this first part with this from the June 18, 2019 article on Mysterious Universe. "Quote: The most baffling aspect of the case is that, as noted by Irma Martin, Dennis managed to disappear within just a few feet of his father and grandfather, who had been calling to him and searching for the boy." within just minutes of last seeing him. How could a child become lost so quickly and remain unseen or heard by those searching for him in such a short span of time? Coupled with the fact that witnesses heard what they what sounded like a, quote, terrible scream coming from someplace on the mountain ridge. Although this was reported at the time in various newspapers, Key told Bouchard in 2016 that he also heard another scream which sounded like a child calling for help. Shortly after the screams were heard, Key and his family observed a disheveled-looking white man moving through the forest nearby who went to the main road at the base of the trail and quickly left in a white automobile. Because the only known interviews with Key were brief newspaper articles that appeared in print and interviews that Key gave to the FBI on two occasions, the fact that he discussed this with Bouchard is certainly significant. Key also told Bouchard that he was advised by the FBI and anonymous phone calls during those interviews not to discuss the case. Speaking on the phone with Bouchard recently, he told me that Key expressed to him at the time in the interview that he wasn't really worried about that anymore because 50 years had passed, so what were they going to do to him now? And he passed away earlier. He passed away a couple of years ago, so Key is dead. So that's basically the story of Dennis Martin's disappearance. So do you think that's related at all, the sighting? I don't know. We're going to get into it because I have six theories. Okay. I have six different theories, uh, ranging from... Don't believe to believe. Okay. Or possible. Mm -hmm. Ranging from implausible to plausible. (laughs) So I can't believe someone suggested this to, well, that makes sense. The first one, number six, theory number six is missing 411 weirdness. Portals, Bigfoots, UFO abduction, etc. I'm placing this at number six, but this does not win my goofiest theory award because my goofiest theory award is going to be down a little further. Okay. But number six is weirdness, I guess, you know. And that's the thing when you when I don't you think look, there's enough weirdness around when this you look case. into these missing four hundred one cases. You, we're like I look at them from the paranormal aspect. Totally, but the more you get into them, the less paranormal yes. aspect there really is. And I think some of them are weird, like the people that report yes. seeing like the the kid that said his grandma was a robot yep. in the cave and gave him food. There's no weirdness around this. No, one, there's though. one. The weirdness is like when there was that one where it was like in the middle of a stream, like on a sandbar that. They had walked past their bunches of oh, pines, yeah. and then the kid turned up there that shouldn't yeah. have. So there is weirdness. There is weirdness in yeah. missing 401 cases. Definitely. This one, I don't feel has any weirdness with it. Right. The fact that he disappeared so quick and was not calling back to them is a little weird. And the number of people searching and for him. And the number of people searching for him. And not finding a yeah. trace. That's weird, but, but it happens. Yeah. But as far as missing 411 weirdness it's as not a paranormal. theory, I'm, right. not, I'm not buying the paranormal aspect nope. of this one. Like no, Trini Gibson. Like a lot of people say the Trini Gibson one is weird. Like she saw something mysterious off the trail, went to look at it and vanished. Mm-hmm. I don't think that was paranormal either. No. Like I feel like this one that is... That was nefarious. Yeah. I feel like this one is not paranormal. And I hate saying that because I know people want it to be. Yeah. I don't think it is either though. There's no like... They found something so far away that he couldn't have gotten that far no. in that time. And I feel, you know what I mean? I feel like what makes this one interesting is the guy's, the witness, Harold Key's sighting of that man. And I feel like if it wasn't for that, this one might not even get a missing for But that's where yeah. the thing happens where people, where he talks about it's like a, a disheveled looking Caucasian male, but other people places websites turning into turn it into almost like a feral man mm. with like <laughs> sure. with like a bearskin cloak yeah. or something like that it was like growling at he was growling and carrying <laughs> something on his shoulder that is obviously supposed to be dennis martin sure 
you know. Also, and, maybe he's been hiking for like 12 miles exactly. and he's exhausted exactly. and maybe dirty. He went to, maybe he went to pee and all of a sudden he sees that this family is watching him and he's like, oh God. Oh God, I just you peed know? in front of people. Yeah. yeah, but no, number six, weirdness. I'm going to eh on that one. Yeah. I don't think there's anything paranormal about this one. No, I don't either. Theory number five, some type of military operation. And this one is kind of, hmm. you know, I have it low on the thing, but this one is interesting. So this comes from the website Texas Cryptid Hunter. He says, quote, The scope of the search for Dennis Martin has given pause to some. Never before has such a large force of government resources been used in a missing persons case. Between the National Park Service employees, various county rescue squads, and military personnel involved, nearly 30,000 man-hours were invested in this search. This total does not include private citizens who volunteered their time. It is the involvement of these military personnel that has raised suspicion among many that something unusual, something other than the disappearance of a small boy, occurred at Spence Field that day in June of 1969. Meaning they came out in the guise of searching for this young like boy, the, but they the were the fact there for that so many reason? military people came out was weird. A lot of people think it's suspicious, it or they were involved oh. in it. While it is not unusual for the National Guard to help in such matters, I have been told that it is highly unusual for a regular military outfit to do so, much less a special forces unit like the Green Berets. There's a lot of stuff tied up with the Green Berets being out there searching for him. The story that they were in the area on a training exercise and were instructed to come help in a search makes no sense to me. As a non-military person, this doesn't seem like anything really unusual, but I have been told by friends in the military that this simply does not happen. A bit of research reveals that the Green Berets are considered a special operations force of the U.S. Army and exist and deploy, whoop, and exist to deploy and execute nine doctrinal missions, none of which include search and rescue operations for a small boy. Digging a bit deeper, secondary missions sometimes taken on by U.S. Special Forces include, among other things, combat search and rescue, hostage rescue, and manhunts. This being the case, perhaps the involvement of the Green Berets is not really as strange as it first seems. Other details, however, do lend an air of mystery to their presence. Many witnesses claim that the, quote, special ops guys were standoffish, unfriendly, and just did their own thing and didn't communicate with anybody else. They didn't talk about where they were searching which intimates a lack of communication and coordination with the other searchers. In addition, multiple reports state that these military units were armed with rifles while conducting their searches. This does sound unusual to me, but I have been unable to confirm this assertion. I have seen the photos of military personnel arriving at Spence Field, but I have not seen any weapons. Hmm. One thing that cannot be denied, though, is that the government and the military were heavily involved in the search for Dennis, much more so than any other missing persons case I can recall. A fixed-wing plane, multiple helicopters, a dozen jeeps, multiple National Guard units, and special forces were called in. Several military command posts were established that seemed to be working independently of the National Park Service and the FBI. In the official case report on the incident, it states that President Nixon himself was monitoring the situation and wanted to be kept up to speed. Hmm. Wow. Okay. The sheer scope of the government and military involvement regarding this event was unprecedented. The question many ask is why? Is it true that Tennessee Con Congressman James Jimmy Quellen requested assistance from the government, but the sheer scale of the effort would have required much more than a call for help from a representative? In any case, the military commitment was extraordinary. You can look up the numbers, but here are some statistics. The Army flew 938 sorties into Spence Field. The Air Force flew 78 sorties, sorties, sorties into Spence Field. The military moved between 1,800 and 2,000 personnel in and out of the area via jeep over the course of the search. The Tennessee Air National Guard was called in the Tennessee Army National Guard, the United States Special Forces, the U.S. Marine Reserve in Knoxville, Tennessee, the Army troops from Fort Benning, Air Force personnel, U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary from Tennessee, Agents from the FBI, two Huey helicopters, two Jolly Green Giant helicopters, one fixed-wing airplane, two CH-53 helicopters, two Air Force communications trucks, and two Chinook helicopters. Wow. Yeah, so the, the amount of military people out there is, like, staggering. I must admit to being quite taken aback regarding the investment of time, money, and resources the federal government committed to search for a civilian missing person. I do not think it a stretch to state that it was highly unusual. It may be the cynic in me, but I simply do not believe that the government was acting out of the goodness of its heart in this matter. Neither do I believe a personal relationship with someone in Congress could yield such a deep level of involvement. Military personnel were flown in from as far away as Florida. It is very strange. That is strange. 
And Does then, it make you wonder if there was something else out there they didn't want that's, that's, searchers that's what to find? That's what we're talking about. That's okay. what we're looking at here. So the, green, the Mysterious Art Universe article talks about these green berets saying that over, over the years, some bizarre details of the case have turned up. Author and researcher David Politis, most mm-hmm. well known for his investigations into missing disappearances and his series of books on the matter called Missing 411, interviewed author Dwight McCarter, the author of Lost, a ranger's journal of search and rescue who had a strange tale to tell about the Martin case. McCarter claimed that during the search for Dennis, the special force units that had been called in had barely communicated at all with authorities, rangers, or civilian searchers, instead working on their own as if they had their own agenda, and that they had been heavily armed as if expecting something big to happen. What could this mean? Another weird detail is that the lead FBI investigator on the case, Agent Jim Reiki, later committed suicide for unknown reasons. Adding to all of this is the presence of armed special operations force troops prowling around the wake of the vanished child. What were they doing there for a civilian disappearance, and why wouldn't they keep law enforcement informed of what they were up to? This is the aspect of the case that was brought up by James Dowell in his mail, in which he directed me to a comment made by an individual on a thread at a forum claiming to be an ex-special forces officer, which offers plenty to think about. This comment originally appeared on the site Tales of the Weird, In 2014, it was posted by a user called Harold Cleveland, in which he shed some possible insight to the military aspect of this case. I am including the full comment here. And remember, this is from an internet forum. This is like from a thread. So this is... Could be anybody. It could be any (laughs) Yahoo. But this is a person, you know, so here it is. Here's his message. To all concerned... I've read some incredibly uninformed and ignorant comments here, and I feel like it's my responsibility to help out when appropriate. My name is Max, so right away he's using a different name than the name of his username. Mm -hmm. My name is Max, and I am a retired Army SOCOM commander. I spent 26 years in service with most of them attached to the 10th Mountain Division in Colorado. Our special forces are never called in to assist in civilian operations. That falls to the local National Guard and is approved by the state governor. The fact that they were armed as well is another huge no-no. During my command and every other mission I was aware of, we were not allowed by federal protocol to do either. Something is very wrong with this missing kid scenario. I've done some research on this case both while on active duty and after my retirement. The inside facts of this case depict a frightening investigation. Bottom line is that searching started within a few minutes of the boy's disappearance and lasted three months with every resource imaginable being deployed. Don't even start with the, quote, the terrain was difficult, holes and caves and cliffs and creeks stuff, etc. Our special troops can find almost anything, anytime, in any terrain. We have the highest technology available worldwide and easily the best training in real-world wartime and mission-specific experience that the normal civilian population can scarcely imagine. In 1969, though? I guess. After studying this case, the fact that no trace of the boy was ever found is just mind-boggling. The Green Berets that were tasked in this search were there for a specific reason. They were armed for a specific reason. I can't and won't say why because my oath documents won't allow it. But I will remind you of these facts. Nationwide, there have only been four occasions where the special forces were brought in on a civilian missing persons case. Two of these involved a possible armed perpetrator. The other two were this case and another similar to it about three years later and regionally nearby. This is out of thousands of missing people cases since the early 60s when our special troops were born. There is no such thing as, quote, well, they were training nearby anyways. Nope, we as commanders would never be allowed to divert orders unless the division general officer, who is at least one star within SOCOM, approved it. For that to happen, it must be for reasons that have a direct effect on our national security. No missing persons case has ever been on that level, ever based on its own merit. My research proved that to my own eyes. In conclusion, this case goes way beyond a simple missing boy. Let me put it this way for you skeptics out there. In 1969, the same year as this case, in the southern jungles of Cambodia, we lost a man on team maneuvers one night. This was in some of the worst weather and impossible terrain known in this world. His tracks were instantly washed away and nighttime operations were notoriously difficult as a rule. After a week's time, it was our dogs that finally tracked him down. They live for these missions and they love it. In the Martin case, the dogs just seemingly laid down whining and refused to search. Several sets of dogs of different breeds. The FBI second-in-command told me this in person. This fact alone promotes the high strangeness factor. These cases are far from normal and must be reinvestigated to ensure that the horror that this family went through never happens to anyone again. What if it's your child that just slips off for a minute and the panic sets in and assets are immediately deployed in great mass? You would expect to find a child pretty quick. But what if they just flat disappear like smoke, as in this case? 
It baffles even the most experienced of us and ba- and breaks our heart as well. I hope this hideous event never happens to any of you, for I have seen it many times firsthand, and you cannot imagine anything worse. God bless you, and thank you for reading. So that's the person's... I mean, he sounds like he knows what he's talking about. He does, but I could too. <laughs> you know, I could go on there and be like, I was with the 75th Division of Manitowoc National Guard make up all this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't know if he was making any of that. So back to that article, it says, In fact, I had not seen this particular piece of information despite my deep research into the case, and I was immediately enthralled by it. It is an astute observation that the commenter throws out little offhand facts, like the number of times special forces have been called out on missing person reports. Is this just a red herring, some piece of fluff made up to make it sound like he knows what he's talking about? It's hard to say. But it's also difficult to find any documentation to corroborate this claim. It's hard to even know if the commenter's real name is Harold Cleveland because he introduces himself as Max. It all adds up to a possible picture of one of the most curious and nonsensical clues in the Dennis Martin case, that of those damn special force troops at the scene. If any of this user's comments are true, what does it all mean? What is the significance of the Green Beret's presence? And if it is, as he says, indicative of some threat to national security, what sort of threat was it and what really happened out there? After all, what could the disappearance of a six-year-old boy possibly have to do with national security? So, yeah. I, and again, I just go to, okay, he went missing. They started with a normal search. They realized there's something else out there they don't want anyone to find. And they're like, okay, we need to go divert yeah. Yeah. A, attention it, away from that's this That's possible. Area. But at the same time, if you're, I don't know. I mean, I get what he's saying, but if you're with like special operations unit and you're you're just doing like a regular boring drill or something like that, wouldn't you want to go help look for a missing boy? I mean, that's your this is like your specialty is like the search and rescue stuff like that. You know, wouldn't you go do that? I get that your officer or the general has to say that, but I don't know. There's there's people that say that they weren't doing this out of the kindness of their hearts, and there's mm-hmm. other people that think they're doing it because it was kind of the right thing to do. It's like you're in the area, just come help search for this boy. Yeah. You would think. Yeah. But then an uh, article from the Tennessean from June 20th, 1969 says, quote, So thick is the green growth of trees in this area that a squirrel could go from Gatlinburg to Cherokee, North Carolina. North Carol- Co- Carolina. Co- Carolina. <laughs> North Carolina, some 30 miles over the mountain without even having to ever touch the ground. The area there is just about as thick as any jungle, and that is one of the reasons why Green Beret troops, many who have fought in the jungles of Vietnam, may have joined the search. Mm. Because it is, it's not like a woods, like I think of a wood, like right. it's dense jungle, like dense like jungle bush. type woods. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people bring up the stuff about the FBI telling him not to discuss the case and the two anonymous phone calls he said that don't discuss what happened out there that day. But this comes from the article, too. The fact that Key was told not to discuss the case publicly by FBI agents James H. Reiki and Wallace F. Estill is understandable. So who who was told not to? Key, the guy that witnessed the guy okay, coming out Key. of the woods. Okay, yep. This was very likely requested with the intention of attempting to preserve the integrity of the investigation since, by virtue of there being FBI involvement, the possibility of there being a kidnapping was considered. So the FBI no doubt hoped to proceed with that kind of investigation, and it didn't want the public getting more information, you know, because they always hold facts back in in a case that would prove that it was the actual perpetrator. But at the same time, wouldn't you want people to be on the lookout for this guy yeah. in the white I mean, that, vehicle? that's one of the, oh, what's the name of the place? That's one of the big sticking points with those two girls that went missing with the guy on the bridge oh, that told yeah. the girls, go down that hill. Yeah. That, there other, that other audio and stuff hasn't been released. Mm-hmm. And I get, you know, it's a double-edged sword. You can release it all and then not have anything that you can use when you catch the guy to catch him as he actually did it. Right. But by giving the people all the information, it might actually help with the search for the person yeah. that did it. Isn't he on trial? I don't know if he's on trial. The, but the they one that they suspect, him, right? they, they suspect they think yeah. it's him. Okay. Yeah. That was very recent. The Delphi. Yeah, the Delphi yes. case, which is just heartbreaking because oh like God. those girls are like my students' age. Yeah. You know. Didn't they ca- capture a video of him or a picture of him? Someone took Snapchat. It. That's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. But we digress. Sorry. Yeah, we digress. That's another case. <laughs> Associated Press articles from around the time of the disappearance that reported what the Key family witnessed at Cade's Cove were vague. At least one of these, for instance, gives the impression that Key's children were able to mistake the man that they observed for being a bear or a, quote, wild man. This odd descriptor appears to have contributed to a number of speculations over the years about whether something akin to the legendary Sasquatch might have been involved with the kidnapping. How do you mistake a man for a bear unless it's Bigfoot? 
Yeah. Numerous attempts, though, have been, and this is weird, numerous attempts have been made by individuals to obtain the FBI's records on the case, which would provide further details, and tons of people, uh, Micah Hanks, then Michael Bouchard, have attempted to file Freedom of Information Acts to the FBI to get the case details, and they do, but they said there's 140 pages, and there's only a couple words that aren't redacted. redacted. Yeah. Yeah, so it's all still redacted. And it's like, why, 50 years later... Are they not releasing stuff about the case? Right. So that is weird. There is some hinky stuff going on there, mm-hmm. but I personally it's more conspiracy theory I, though. Yes, than I personally strange. don't see anything conspiratorial about the Green Berets and about all the military involvement. I don't it's know like you're enough helping about look it. Look for a kid. Yeah. You, you know, would think and, they would just do it to help. Most people say that the Green Berets were not armed. Nobody, they don't remember seeing any That's military weird. people armed, but other places say that they were heavily armed. <laughs> so it's like... They're two wildly different statements. <laughs> yeah. But the Green Berets stuff kind of floats down into theory four, which is feral humans. Oh. Yeah. There's two, two sub-theories for this one. Sub-theory number one is that Dennis was taken and killed slash eaten slash whatever by feral humans. So yeah. There's... I think there are back... And this is what shows up on TikTok. That this is part of the proof that there are, f- you know, like the movie Wrong Turn or whatever it is where they yeah. go in the woods and there's or like the hills have eyes where these mutants and whatever living in the woods. Yeah. But that's, that's what the TikTok... That's why TikTok right now is causing a resurgence of this case is because they're looking at the feral humans aspect of it. I mean, I think there are backwoods people who are very territorial and you yeah. don't want to yep. trespass, yep. but I don't know about feral humans. So here, here's a couple things I got off Reddit. Somebody writes, I'm on the North Carolina side of the Great Smoky Mountains. I've lived here my entire life. All of us here know what's in these woods and mountains. Since the 30s or 40s, there have been feral wild men living in these mountains. They are fast. They will snatch livestock and snatch children. The FBI knows this. It's why they don't get involved. I've heard other stories that there was some attempt to kill these feral wild men, but they still exist, even today. And I'm not talking about some end-of-days extremist who took to the woods. I mean feral, completely wild men, their own language, living underground. We do not go into the woods at night. During the day, we make sure to stay in the trails. Sometimes you will smell it, that putrid smell. At night, you'll hear them hollering, supposed inbreds. The locals around here know what happened to Dennis Martin. He was snatched by one of the feral wild men. It is not uncommon for people to go missing here. They are normally found, but you'd be surprised on the number of children that just disappear. The FBI has covered up for years. Where do you think the movie The Hills Have Eyes come from? It's true. I hear them from time to time, disturbing sounds. They live all up and down the mountains here in national parks and forests. That's freaky to think about. It is freaky to think about. And somebody else replied to that saying, I've lived in the Smoky Mountains, North Carolina for 30 years. I've camped by myself. I've hiked and hunted and I'm female. I was raised in the mountains. I've spent a lot of time there, sometimes very deep in the backwoods. I never saw a feral man. (laughs) I've seen ginseng hunters, lots of bears and other animals, moonshiners twice. That was probably the scariest encounter. I ran into a very lost hiker, an occasional mountain man or family, but nobody feral. They all just wanted to be left alone with the exception of the lost hiker who was terrified that he was never going to get out of there. Those mountains are full of weird stories and tales. Most intersect with Native American legends, but are they true? I don't know. Not in my experience. That's really funny. One person is like, I lived here and I swear this is real. Another person's like, yeah, Yeah. this is not real. (laughs) Then somebody else replied and said, I've spent countless times in the Tennessee side of those hills. My family settled there eons ago. Now, I was always warned not to go too deep into the woods. There are a lot of private folk out there who will shoot you. There are so many homes that one would think that they're abandoned because they're falling apart, but one day you'll see a bit of smoke coming out of the chimney or some tattered quilts hanging on a clothesline. A lot of folks do not have access to education, health care, electricity, running water, or people to communicate with. It can be a very isolating life. Never have I once heard tales of feral men snatching children. The poverty of Appalachia is astounding and not really something a lot of people from the States can understand if you are not familiar with this area. While I do think there are people in the woods who are likely to be inbred, have behavioral issues and psychological issues, I do not think there is a group of inbred kitty snatchers who have been living underground societies for eons. I think that actual people there might have turned into the scary stories passed on at the campfire to scare people, but that's just kind of sad, though. Instead of trying to get them help, we just create scary stories about them to keep them further isolated. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So there is a little bit of everything. Some mm-hmm. people saying, yeah, there are feral men living in the mountains that are stealing kids and eating them. And other people saying you're nuts. <laughs> this yeah. comes from the smokies.com. 
But some people believe Dennis Martin was the victim of a more vicious attack by cannibalistic feral humans who are said to live undetected in the national park. And the reason nothing was ever found of his body or clothing is because they are hidden far from the view and the safety of their hidden colony. Over the years, Harold Key's account made it to the internet, where charlatans, shysters, and hucksters have teamed with conspiracy theorists and other curious folk who have formed wild theories about feral humans in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park regarding what really happened to Dennis Martin. One of the most popular theories involves wild men, feral humans who live in the mountains and go about snatching livestock and children at night. There are videos on YouTube, TikTok, and all social media, not of the wild men, of course, but of authoritative sounding people discussing the wild men and the FBI cover up as if it's just simply common knowledge. People believe that there are humans who have lived in the wild so long that they are closer to beasts than men. Some believe them to have their own language and apparently quite a putrid smell that forewarns of their arrival, which is just pretty much infective, ineffective feraling, if you ask me. Allegedly, they're cannibals too. Wild men could be descendants of mountain people who went deep into the forest before there was a park, and like the tribes of the rainforest, operate outside the realms of society. One guy who made a very nice video walking his fairly rotund weenie dog through a cemetery <laughs> specula see that. speculated that a feral person could be indigenous personnel who slipped away before the Trail of Tears and survived in the forest well into the 1900s. He added that some of the feral people spoke English, others their own language, and still others grunted or didn't have discernible speech. The same guy indicated that his uncles were paid by the FBI to hunt the feral population prior to Dennis's disappearance. Remember those Vietnam-era Green Berets? Our friends with conspiracy theories would have us believe they weren't just there as part of a search party. People theorized that their true mission was to find feral humans. His account is conflicting with most reports, though. If they were hunting feral humans, they would be armed. No one reports seeing heavily armed Green Berets looking for Dennis. So if we have, or had, bands of cannibalistic humans roaming the park and abducting and eating folk, why don't we know about it? Well, that answer is as simple as it is idiotic. We, the good people of Tennessee and western North Carolina, make a lot of money off the park and we don't want to lose the cash cow by telling the world of feral humans. Apparently, we're willing to go on living next to these humanoids out of an H.G. Wells novel just to keep you all coming to our parks. <laughs> While the idea of feral wild people isn't exactly likely, it's true that these mountains are a good place for people who want to get lost. While I don't believe that, even in 1969, a tribe of people could go undetected in the forest for long, could a loner or a hermit live in the mountains for months or even years? Sure. Could a hermit do it anywhere near Cade's Cove? No, probably not. We read stories of people who adopt new identities and go live on the hiking trail as long hikers. We hear about wanted criminals who go into the mountains to hide in remote areas of the park. The key is that most of these people interact with some version of civilization, either, either coming out to restock or resupply or meet other hikers along the trail. But in today's society, hermit homesteading deep in the woods is unlikely. For example, could they build a structure, hunt, and live off the land? I think they'd probably have to do a little farming as well. I suppose it is possible. People hide stills and moonshine operations up there, but it still seems unlikely. Also, wild people and feral humans aren't known to drive white vehicles. And it was 1969. <laughs> Let's just say disheveled people acting weird in the woods wasn't as strange as it would be today. It's mostly likely that Mr. Key found someone on a bad trip. Finally, the idea that you could carry a six-year-old struggling human boy through miles of rough, rough brush to get back to your car is almost as implausible as a tribe of wild people. If you ask me, the only wild people are the ones on the internet. So I suppose he could have been unconscious, but that goes against the idea that they heard a scream and yeah, him yelling but, help. But they think that the scream might have been him getting knocked out? Could be. I don't know. So but that's, he, that's, he would have been awake and struggling That's sub-theory that. number one is that Dennis was taken by these cannibalistic inbred and poo feral on humans that. well sub theory two is my ridiculous theory oh. it's my goofy theory it wins my goofy theory of the day award okay sub theory two under feral humans is dennis martin never existed this, this <laughs> these people <laughs> believe these people believe that the whole thing was a ruse created by the government to get enough people searching and traipsing through the park so that the feral humans living there would be flushed out into the open where the Green Berets and military personnel would kill them. Oh my god. So that gets my goofiest theory of the day. Can you hear the eye roll happening yeah. right now? <laughs> so Dennis Martin never existed. It was a lie the government made to get all these people in the woods to flush out the feral humans that the Green Berets were going to kill. So his family must not have existed uh, Apparently they were, what do they call actors? them, crisis actors. Oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah, 
That is sub Let's theory. Let's skip to the next yeah. one. It's yeah. <laughs> so bad. I don't even want to talk about it. I need to make a little trophy that they can get the goofiest yeah. theory of the day award. And now to number three. And remember, these are getting more likely to more me plausible. as they go on. Okay. Theory number three, animal attack. On the subject of animal activity in Cade's Cove, a similar theory holds that Dennis may have been the victim of an animal attack. Dwight McCarter and others noticed at the time that it was a period of drought and it contributed to fewer natural food sources for a lot of the wildlife in the park. Hence, animals such as black bears had been uncharacteristically aggressive during the spring and summer months of 1969. The Martin family said that they had seen several bears observed around Spence Field during their time in the park, and they said that their behavior seemed, quote, bolder than usual. In addition to black bears, there are also wild boar that range throughout the park. Although coyotes are commonly seen in the park today, though, they weren't believed to have migrated there in 1969. However, there were plenty of other animals in the park that under the conditions of this lean period might have acted more aggressively towards a child. Weeks before the boy's disappearance, park rangers caught a bony bear that they were able to lure with cone. Cone. <laughs> Boy. Weeks before Dennis's disappearance, park rangers caught a bony bear that they were able to lure with corn, which usually isn't even what bears eat. At the time, though, the bear's typical food sources were scarce and they would have eaten what they could to survive. But, that being said, they found no clues of an animal attack. There would have been blood, be there would have been clothing, left. there would have been a body. Bones, anything. They found absolutely nothing. Dennis was only missing for a few moments. Like, he was close enough that you would think he would have cried out if an animal was attacking him. Mm-hmm. And they said it was just missing for a couple of seconds. They never found any trace of it. So, animal attack? I just don't buy that. Because there would have been some trace by now. Yes. I could see if he had gotten far enough into the woods that they wouldn't have heard him. Yeah. And he had been dragged away or something. But again. Well, a lot of his dad's accounts were that he was a quiet boy. But if his someone would have called out to him, he would have answered. Did they bring cadaver dogs? I don't think so. Hmm. I don't think so. Because there's one part coming up where it's like they should. They still should. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay. A lot of we'll get to that in this yeah. episode. I got curted so many times today. So that's number three, animal attacks. So, so far we have had recapping. We have had missing 411 weirdness, portals, Bigfoot, UFO, Feral puck people. wudgies. <laughs> uh, what's the one from Rhinelander? The Hodag. The Hodag. You know, so that is num- there's number six, weirdness, portals, whatever. Number five, some kind of weird military operation. Mm-hmm. Number four, feral humans, bunch of cannibals in the woods. Number three, animal attack. And that leads to number two, kidnapping. This one I kinda I can kind of I can kinda buy to be honest with you. One interesting thing is that uh, there was it's he's not unnamed anymore because I saw his name in one of the documents, but it was said that there was an unnamed man from Dandridge, Tennessee, who had been camping at Spence Field when Dennis went missing, and that William Martin, Dennis's dad, told Park Rangers that this Mr. Doe as he was called, sort of clung to William for most of the search. Like, he stuck with him and kind of wouldn't leave his side. And then in a strange twist, an unknown woman claiming to possess ESP contacted the Miami Police Department and asked to speak with Dennis's mother. Mrs. Martin agreed to call this woman, and this woman told her that she needed to watch out for this Mr. Doe from Dandridge, Tennessee. That's weird. Which is weird. That is very weird. Uh, Mrs. Martin asked the police if Mr. Doe and the lady from Miami could somehow be working together and have taken Dennis, but they didn't know. Authorities followed up on the suggestion, but there's no public record showing that they believed this to be suspicious enough to pursue further investigations. But it's weird that this guy that was there kind of stuck with his dad, Mm -hmm. like just to keep an eye on stuff. And then Mm -hmm. this woman who claimed to be a psychic called and said that she needs to watch out for this guy. Yeah. It is, I mean, we know criminals sometimes like to insert themselves in the investigation. Yes, so. yes. But uh, Bouchard, the one that wrote that book, met, talked to this guy, like asked this guy. Like he tracked him down and talked to him. And this guy, he didn't say on the po- on Micah Hanks' podcast what he said, but he said everything he said kind of made sense. That mm. He didn't think that this guy had anything to do with it. Okay. But that was just interesting. Yeah. Another theory is that the Dr. Martin and his sons who had met up with the Martins in Russell Field, people wondered if maybe there wasn't a plan to kidnap one of his kids and they got the wrong Martin boy. 
that they got Dennis instead of one of the other Martin's sons. Was he like some important person? He, he was a doctor. He had a PhD. I mean, he was, he was, you know, maybe they thought he had money, money and that they could grab one of his kids and they grabbed one of the wrong Martin boys. Could be. It's possible, but the FBI followed up on it, but there's no public information that shows any evidence that this could be true. Other people suggest that, you know, some people say that the other kids that were there, you know, sent him off to not be with them because he had his red shirt. Some people think that they told him go surprise somebody else on the trail hmm. and that maybe he jumped out and surprised the wrong person who grabbed him and took him. Could be. Which is possible. There are bad people in the woods, you yeah, know. Yeah, but most of the kidnapping theory hinges on the Harold Key family witnessing the guy coming out of the woods. There were no trails connecting the site. The distance as the crow flies, we, we said, is 3.95 miles. And it's said that, you know, that Dwight McCarter said he was able to make it in the in the allotted time, but he said it was difficult and he wasn't carrying a boy with him. So it is possible, but it's kind of improbable, it especially feels like a stretch, especially dragging a struggling kid with you. But the key story about the boy calling for help and then screaming in pain is pretty significant. Mm -hmm. But when he said the, the they help, they never found anything, right? No. When he said the calling for help thing, he was 90 years old. And could he have been buying into the own the belief oh. that there was something? Are there big cats in that area? I think there I, must I, be. There must be. They make weird noises. They do. But is it was it Dennis that they heard that if it was could have been anybody. You know, but so much of this whole thing hinges on the Harold Key witnessing the guy coming out of the woods. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't know kidnapping, maybe, but it's just the to. To drag a struggling boy that amount of distance through the woods, mm -hmm. not on trails, but through the rugged woods, seems very unlikely. Who's to say that someone somewhere else on the trail didn't take him, though? Yeah. This is just a coincidence. Yeah. This guy had nothing but who's to do to with say it. But who's to say that the screaming wasn't, wasn't him? Because they yeah. said it sounded like it was distant. Oh. So maybe maybe that was Dennis, but the guy in the woods was had freaked out by the sound of a kid yeah. screaming and he got, he got like, out of I'm Dodge. Out of here. Yeah. He got out of Dodge. It's Could possible. Be. You know, Could have been just another person on the trail who fell. Yeah. Y you just, I mean, yeah. I don't know, but it just, it's tied on with the Dennis Martin disappearance. Mm -hmm. So that's theory. Number two, kidnapping. Okay. Maybe theory. Number one, theory. theory. Number one, of course, got lost, died of exposure. Right. He's out there somewhere. Yep. Arguably the most popular theory about the disappearance and one endorsed by a number of individuals who have looked at the case over the ensuing decades holds that Dennis was lost much closer to the PLS or point last seen near Spence Field and might have become disoriented and wandered farther away from the location where his family had been. Park Service reports quoting William Martin as saying that his son was quiet and quote would not call out but would answer to strangers. Further, due to complications from the heavy rain that followed in the hours after his disappearance, it's not inconceivable that Dennis might have suffered hypothermia if he was alone somewhere on the mountain and exposed to the elements. Scavenging by wildlife thereafter could further reduce the possibilities that his remains would have been found. Oh, poor little guy. And tied in with this is the matter of the ginseng hunters. So in 1985, Dwight McCarter and Ronald Schmidt published a book called Lost, a ranger's journal of search and rescue. In the book, McCarter talks about getting contacted by a pair of illegal ginseng hunters, which is a thing. Like, there's ginseng in that area, and people, mm -hmm. you're not supposed to take it from national parks, but people go out and pick Can't the ginseng. just grow it? Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I know Wisconsin's a bit, ginseng's a big thing in Wisconsin. Yeah, we I have a coworker ginseng. who grows it. But if it's growing in a national park, it's illegal to take it out of the national park, but there's people that go there and get it. Mm. So the account in the book is given as follows. Quote, in July of 1985, I was contacted by a longtime ginsenger who I knew well. He related a story of one of his trips in search of ginseng in the park several years earlier. He said that he and one friend were looking for, quote, sing, ginseng slang term, I guess, up in the big hollow in the Tremont area. They were proceeding up the right side of the stream and were about 200 feet away from the creek. As they neared a little waterfall, he noticed some bones lying near where a tree had uprooted and left a level place. He said that the bones looked to be that of a child, which included the skull. He said it looked like animals had scattered the bones. He thought this might be Dennis Martin. Not long after this report, I contacted my good friends at the Swain County Rescue Squad in Bryson City, North Carolina. They brought 30 men the following weekend, and we did a thorough search of the hollow, but found nothing. And But because the ginseng guy 
was worried about getting arrested. It was five years in between when he saw the skeleton oh. and when they searched. So the location might be a little uh, or the, fuzzy. Or the, the bones are gone. gone. Yeah. yeah. But he swears that him and his friend found, and apparently from what Micah Hank said on his, that every child that has gone missing from that park the remains have been found or they have been found except for Dennis. Mm. That's so they where said, a cadaver dog they, would come in and handy. That's what Micah Hanks said. He said they should go there even now with cadaver dogs that might get a hit on that area. Even if so he just was a pushing, fragment of a bone yeah, out there. He was you know? pushing for them to go there now to that area. Because now you could do DNA testing probably. But a lot of this depends on... But it's like, dude, just say you were there for something else. Right. Don't say you were there. Yeah. Because the fact that at least five years, it might have been five to seven years passed in between them finding the skeleton and them reporting the skeleton. Yeah. And so much of this depends on if that's accurate, if this really happened. Because mm-hmm. if this really did happen, chances are that was the remains of Dennis His Martin. family could have gotten some yeah. closure. But if this is true, I believe that was his remains. Mm-hmm. But so that's that's what I got for lost. It would, it would have to be if all of their kids had been found. And it's very possible that he walked off into the brush and just got lost and hit the trail and went the wrong direction. And by then he was way... Too lost, panicked, ran into the woods. Well, and did but they one... search in a certain direction because that's where they saw him go on the trail? Yes. He could have actually yeah, he could have cut through and but, backtracked. But they had how many, 1,400 people yeah. out there or whatever? I'm guessing they searched everywhere. But one interesting theory that I kind of like is that it's a combination of kidnapping and lost, where mm-hmm. this guy did have Dennis, but when he realized that a family saw him, he let Dennis go. And jumped in his car and left. And Dennis panicked and just ran further into the woods and then died of exposure. exposure. That that could totally be true. Yeah. Hmm. So that's what I got. Wow. So now uh, I just want to... little downer. I just want (laughs) to close with this from the Micah Hanks article. He says, quote, To this day, the FBI file on the Dennis Martin disappearance has not been made available to the public, despite hundreds of Freedom of Information Act attempts and subsequent appeals. The FBI was investigating a possible kidnapping, said Michael Bouchard. The evidentiary information was confidential and was recorded in the FBI report, not in the civilian documentation published by the Department of the Interior. I attempted a Freedom of Information Act in the FBI report, which was approximately 147 pages, of which approximately 146 pages were fully redacted. (laughs) So they had one page that had stuff on it. I recently spoke with Michael Bouchard about the case, and in addition to above testimony, two colleagues of mine, John Greenwald and Lieutenant Timothy McMillian, have attempted also to obtain Freedom of Information Acts of the FBI's material on the case, but no files have been released by the Bureau. Additionally, I have personally sent Freedom of Information Acts to the Special Forces Unit at Fort Bragg with requests for any records kept about Green Beret involvement in the search, as well as Freedom of Information Acts to the National Park Service, seeking any audio recordings of any material pertinent to the case. In all these instances, I have been told that no such records exist. With relevance to the FBI investigation of a possible kidnapping at that time, Michael Bouchard told me during our conversations that Harold Key was specifically asked not to discuss the case. Additionally, on two separate occasions, he received anonymous telephone calls advising him to forget about what he saw at the creek that day. Although such admissions add an element of intrigue to the case, it's the opinion of this author that the FBI had just wanted to dissuade Key from public discussion of what he observed while their investigation was underway as a means of preserving the integrity of their investigation without arousing unwanted attention or speculation from the public. Perhaps the most likely conclusion is that Dennis just became lost and disoriented someplace close to the Spence Field area where he was last seen. Upon personal review of the area and the surrounding terrain, if Dennis had been injured, attacked by a wild animal, or had fallen into an accessible area nearby, locating the child could have been made exceedingly difficult. Thick foliage that covers the Great Smoky Mountains from June through September when the search was underway would only further hamper search efforts, making it more likely that a six-year-old child could have remained hidden, especially if he were injured or deceased following the storm that occurred on the night that he disappeared. The scenario above seems most likely in terms of probability. However, it is also my feeling based on a complete review of the case that there is a good chance, perhaps not rock solid, but one worthy of further inquiry to be made that a kidnapping scenario was at least possible. Mm -hmm. And one of the positive things to come out of the case is that the failure to properly organize the search for Dennis led by the National Park Service 
caused them to overhaul their search and rescue operations throughout the National Park Service. Agencies across the United States and around the world followed their lead. Due to changes made in large-scale search and rescue operations following the Dennis Martin disappearance, many lives have been saved. I do find the redacted file strange. Yeah. It's so a now I got six-year-old. What do you think? So now it ends with what do you think? I think it's either lost and I, uh, succumbed to the elements yeah. or kidnapped or, or a combination of the two. I just have such a hard time. Unless there was some other vehicle involved where they, where they managed to quickly scoot Dennis to the area where the guy came out of the woods. Yeah, I just I don't really believe that guy was involved. No. But there were But like I said, a what complicates things is that paranormal websites and TikTok and all that is saying that this guy was like a wild man that came out of the woods and he wasn't. He was just a dude like a disheveled. I found it I, I, the one thing that really sticks out to me is his quote to his wife, that man is thinking strange thoughts. Mm-hmm. That's so weird to me. That quote. Yeah, that is odd. You know, I mean, is it possible that that this guy did have Dennis, and then when he saw the family watching him, Dennis he let Dennis down, and Dennis ran off and died? Or it was just a weird but coincidence. I I think if the ginseng hunter story is true that they found a skeleton of a child, I think that Dennis got lost. Yeah, I think I think it's so easy to get lost, especially like six year old boy. It's never been there before. Right. You know, I think he maybe went into the brush, hit the trail and went the wrong way down the trail and quickly realized he was, he didn't know where he was. But you also think that he would have heard his family yelling for him unless he got so far so fast. And maybe, yeah. Yeah. And feral humans, you're not. Not buying that <laughs> at all. Do you, what about the idea that he never really existed? And I that don't he, buy that at okay. all. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, I, I, I'm doing Occam's razor on this one, and yep. I think he simply got lost. I, I don't agree. think there's anything hinky. I think the guy coming out of the woods all sweaty and disheveled, maybe he had a poop. I yeah, don't know. I had that thought too. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I was like, maybe he had a serious case of the runs, and he was like, I got to get out of here. You got the sweats, you know? Yeah, he got the, maybe the guy had the poop sweats, and it's like, I got to get out of here, jumped in his car, and totally took off, of you that. know? But so much, so much of the kidnapping stuff hinges on hit on key's testimony of what he saw and that's so heard. weird though because the trail how many people are probably on that trail who could have taken him it, and even just hurt him and discarded his body somewhere yeah, you know what i mean yeah. it, why is it that guy but but between dennis martin and, and trenny i kind of really want to go to this park i really want to <laughs> visit the smoky mountains national park just wear like some kind of gps okay. device and like <laughs> i think it's cool like the new iphone the new iPhones have that emergency satellite phone thing where even oh. if you're lost and there is no signal, I didn't see it'll that. contact a satellite. That's so, cool. Yeah. But, you know, like for the when army we take stuff. Our trip next year. The, ar- yeah, the army stuff, I don't see as sketchy. I don't know enough about it to I'm know. I generally that it's want to more jump on a conspiracy theory, I think, than Krista is. Mm. And I don't see anything mm-hmm. super sketchy about the yeah. Green Berets being there. No. I don't think that Dennis Martin was a hoax and that they were flushing feral humans out of the woods. No, I don't even think feral <laughs> humans are a thing. I, they might be, but I don't think... Not to the level that they're talking about. You know, but then I did see articles that tied this in and said Trenny Gibson was also taken by a feral human. Oh, geez. Okay. You know, so they were both like in the same area, mm-hmm. Klingman's Dome they talk about. So it's unusual that there's a couple weird disappearances there. You know, maybe there were. But if somebody was planning on taking him, they had to have been stalking the family because I doubt the chances of running into somebody randomly on the Appalachian Trail in the woods and kidnapping them is likely. But I have heard over the years, especially to women, if you're going to hike the Appalachian oh, yeah. Trail, don't yeah. do it alone. No, I hear there's there's like reddits of all sorts of weird yeah. stories about stuff on the or Appalachian Trail. Or if you're going trail. to have a weapon. Like yeah. Bring the Appalachian a Appalachian Trail kind of freaks me out because I hear a lot of stuff about the Appalachian Trail. You're out at, you're at the mercy yeah. of whoever you run into yeah. and I there are bad people everywhere. But in this situation, I think it's more he got lost. Yeah. I think he's I a 6-year-old so boy in the deep woods for the first time there. Yeah. And I think he got I wish it sucks that a little moment like the kids telling you not to come with them because they you have a red right. shirt that on. That decision. That little decision. You know, ended his life. Yeah, but mo- yeah. like his family, I think most of his family is deceased. Is yeah. deceased by now, and it just sucks. So, but this is a this is one that brings people into missing four one one. This is yeah. one of the ones. But a lot of that is because I do remember covering a, a this. lot of that is because the the stuff with the guy coming out of the woods, Harold Key stuff, is embellished to make it sound mm-hmm. more Sasquatchy I than it really is. Than, yeah, yeah. 
so yeah, hmm. I think we're on the same page here. We yep, think totally. It's possible he was kidnapped, but I think he just just got lost in the woods and. I think the ginseng hunters were probably right, yep. and that was him. But it's, it's a like, shame they didn't say something. I know, sooner, I know. But oh my god! Like I said, come up and say, I don't know. We were just walking on a trail, it's and like we they found were this growing kid. weed out there. No, like <laughs> no, but they were worried about getting arrested for it. So oh, it's you like get arrested for picking. But Micah ginseng? Hanks, like Micah, like I said, it's a million times better than ours. Listen to that, Micah Hanks. Maybe I'll even post it in the strangers because he talks to that that Bouchard, okay. and it's a really good talk. And Bouchard at the end goes off on this rant saying. It sucks that there's that he, he doesn't name missing 411, but he says it sucks that there's this stuff that makes these disappearances sound mysterious and weird when they're not. Mm-hmm. It's just that a boy got lost. Right. You know, but it's a really, really good interview. So I like Micah Hanks. Like he's like us. Like he calls it like he sees it. If he thinks it's BS. Yeah. But Krista is going with the theory that Dennis Martin never existed and that it was just the <laughs> Green Berets flushing out the feral humans from the park. Yep, both of so, those. So 100%. So what do you guys think? What do you guys think about the Dennis Martin disappearance? Do you think it was Occam's razor? He just disappeared. Do you think he was kidnapped? Do you think it was weirdness? I think it was Bigfoot. Yeah, do you think it was a flesh gate? Whatever. Let us, let us know what it was. No flesh gates. That's what I got. Cool. Well, it's a shorty this week, an hour and 50 minutes. Dang. Well, we still got wow. the song. We yeah. still got, it's probably only, it's probably going to be a shorter one. I I actually was going to make this a two person one, but I thought the Dennis Martin one might oh, be kind of lengthy. Oh, it took up the whole time. Yeah. It did take up the whole time, but it, it's, it's rough because I want the missing four on one stuff to be weird and not, yeah, it's not always going but to be. But it's just mm-hmm. tragic and it's a kid got lost. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't feel like there's anything paranormal about this one. Maybe I mean, how many do. times have you heard a parent say, I looked away for just a second? Yeah. But you know? on the other hand, the paranormal stuff is what is keeping the Dennis Martin case in the public eye, yeah. which is important. That yeah. it, it does, It's not forgotten. It has a benefit. But it's just so, so misconstrued, mm-hmm. especially, like I said, there's so many TikTok videos about where somebody being like, dude, there's feral people that live in this park. They took, you know, be careful when you go to Smoky Mountains National Park, whatever. <coughs> If you're a feral person, contact us. <laughs> let us know. Because you, we know you have technology. You and you're have, listening yeah, to podcasts. <laughs> but our song choice for today, I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And this one might be. I'm gonna give a little explanation for this one. Um, I don't even know where to start with this one. I usually do the YouTube comments first, but this time I'm doing them after I say what the song is. But so there is a show that a lot of people know that I really like called Letterkenny, a Canadian show about a town in Canada called Leonard Kenny. And it's about the, the, you know, the hockey players that live there, the, the Hicks that live there and like how they all interact. It's a really good show. It's funny. Um, like I said, I always remember that I told Sophie to watch it and she watched a couple episodes and she texted me back and she said, I can't decide if this is the dumbest show I've ever seen or the <laughs> smartest show I've ever seen. Yeah. But in the show, every couple episodes, they have a character named Shorzy who shows up for like, five or six seconds you never see his face he's always either got his back to you or he's in a bathroom stall making disgusting noises on the toilet and you never see his face because he's played by jared kiso who plays the main character of the show as well that's funny it's just him doing a high-pitched voice (laughs) and shorzy shows up to give characters some of the most obscene disgusting insults that you've ever heard and that's basically that's basically what it is he's just like a little one note minor stupid character Mm -hmm. So the last couple seasons of Letterkenny have been a little rocky. They haven't been the greatest. And this last season, they announced that they were also doing a Shorzy spinoff show. And How's that going to work? Everybody, including myself, hardcore Letterkenny fans all cringe. They're mm. like, oh my God, this is, they're like, please, for the love of God, don't do this. <laughs> so everybody was like, oh my God, no, 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 no. So I avoided anything to do with the show. And I avoided looking at reviews, but all of a sudden I would hear bits and pieces where people are saying this show is so good. And I was like, I was so skeptical. So I finally, a couple weeks ago, watched it's six episodes, half an hour long episodes. It's like three hours. So I finally watched it and it is one of the best things I think I've ever watched. And it just like floored me how good it was. Um, and I, then I went and read reviews and everybody was like saying the same thing. Everybody was like, oh my God, this is better than Letterkenny. Because Letterkenny is good, but it's almost more like a series of skits 
than it is like a cohesive story sure. where, where Shorzy has a cohesive story. He he's sent up to Sud, Sudbury, Ontario to join a losing hockey team. And his goal is for them not to lose any more games that season. So, so it can has you a, finally see his face? Yeah, it's okay. Jerry Kiso. It's, okay. Jer- it's, Jer- it's Jerry Kiso. But uh, it's just so good. Like, I, I was floored. I watched it now six times. Wow. I've, I've watched the entire... S- it's the same humor. And... It's the same humor, okay. but it's more... Uh, it, it's still, like, filthy talk. Like, mm-hmm. that's the weird thing about Letterkenny is, like, they. it's, like, people describe it as, like, the most obscene but still wholesome show. And yeah. it is. It's, like, it has a weird... You know, it's just like that kind of dumb humor. Like, they're, like my favorite scene is just like a stupid little throwaway scene where, where uh, the girl who owns the team is in with her friend in the kitchen talking, and they see Shorzy and the rest of the hockey players out on the patio in the snow grilling out. And they're looking at them talking, and she's like, they better be talking about winning. And then it cuts to outside, and they're outside arguing about whether or not popcorn chicken or popcorn <laughs> shrimp is better. Just like that kind of humor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, okay. and it's got, it's got, it's, it's disgusting. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of swearing on there. But it's so good. And I'm not going to give any spoilers, but my song is from the season finale of the first season. And it is the song True Love by someone named Tobias Jesso Jr. I'm not going to give any spoilers about where the song pops up or how the song is used, but it's just so good. And after after I got done with that episode, I was like literally bawling. Aww. And I felt so stupid. And then when I went online and read these reviews, everybody said that they were crying. Okay. So I didn't feel quite as stupid anymore after, <laughs> after I read that. But uh, so here's a couple of the quotes Here's a couple of the quotes from under the YouTube song. Somebody writes, one of the most beautiful love songs I've ever heard, and I end up discovering it through a Canadian TV show about a foul-mouthed but ultimately good-natured small-town hockey player. What a time to be alive. (laughs) And somebody else says, quote, I just saw the Shorzy season finale. Wow. When I first saw that a faceless, one-dimensional supporting character from Letterkenny was getting his own show, I, like everybody else, had pretty low expectations. But I was just blown away by how good the show was. And the finale, and the part of the finale that made use of this song, it was nothing short of magnificent and incredibly moving. That's something that I certainly didn't expect from this show at all. Amazing. Somebody else writes, if someone would have told me that a spinoff of Letterkenny featuring the annoying character Shorzy would be an amazing show, I would have called them crazy. And if they then told me that the show was actually going to make me cry, I would have called them even crazier. I would have been wrong on both counts. And somebody else writes, my girlfriend hates hockey, absolutely hates it. But she sat and watched Shorzy with me, complaining at first, but by episode five, she was completely invested. Shortly after we watched the final scenes of the season finale, I found her online buying both of us Sudbury Bulldogs hockey jerseys. If that's not true love, I don't know what is. <laughs> so that is my song. It is a song, True Love, by Tobias Jesso Jr. If you have not watched Shorzy, it is on Hulu. Watch Shorzy. It is three hours. It's just so good. If you've ever seen the movie Slapshot from the 70s with Paul Newman about a hockey team, Mm-mm. it's very much like that movie. Okay. Uh, very much like that movie. Like Slapshot has three hockey players called the Hanson brothers who are like the, not the band. No, <laughs> no, they're, they're, but they're the ones that will just go out and just start beating people up okay. for no reason. They're like the, and, and Shorzy has that. It has three characters named the Jims because oh. they're all named Jim who are like their, their beat them, go out and beat them up guys. But it's so good. So do yourself a favor, watch it. Watch it with the caption, close captions on, because between the Canadian accents and the hockey terminology, hmm. you're going to be confused. But seriously, Canadian it is, accent? Don't they just talk like youpers, basically? They talk like us. Okay. But, you know, people, I don't people need... say we have accents. I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, I don't know what they're talking about. You know, and so. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, go watch Shorzy. Cool. Seriously, so good. And that's what I got for That's my song choice. So... I, I'm not watching it yet, but I wanted to mention that coming this month, I think it comes out the 13th, maybe. There's a short, what do they call it, a limited series or whatever on Netflix <coughs> about a story we covered on here, the true story of The Watcher. 
Oh, yes, I did see that. I'm really excited yeah. to watch it. It That's could be terrible. I, think Corey I don't was know. On. Corey was on that episode when we talked about The Watcher. I think so, yeah. yeah. Yep, it was a mini mystery. That was such a freaky story where it the people are getting the letters story. sent to their they house. They finally had to sell their house at yeah. like a big loss. Like yeah, recently. Yeah, because people are constant. That's. They're afraid to live there. Yeah, but also you have to figure people are coming. House. People are coming, driving by it, sure, looking at it. That too. You know, I think it's mostly because they're such terrified. A freaky story. So uh, it really is, and I'm it's curious. a shame because that house is stunning. Yeah, I'm curious how that's going to be. Yeah, I, is who Naomi Watts is in it. Yeah. There's a bunch of people in it. It looks good. Oh, I had such a crush on her in Mulholland Drive. Oh, do you ever see Mulholland Drive? Maybe it, that's a weird movie. That's right? a weird movie. Like I have a weird love hate thing with David Lynch. Like, yeah, it's he, a David he Lynch freaks movie. Me okay. out. He freaks me out nonstop. Yeah. Uh, I I love Twin Peaks. Mm. The, I I didn't see the stuff that was on. I saw the original series. I didn't see the yeah. later stuff. Mm-hmm. But I love Twin Peaks. But yeah, he was in Mulholland Drive. He did Mulholland Drive, and has a weird movie. But let me know how that is because I'm super curious. Yeah, I'm how excited that is. to watch it for sure. Um, what else do I got? I talked about Shorzy. Brian Brian Young was one of the people that was like badgering me to watch Shorzy. Mm-hmm. Like so many of my friends were. They're like, it's not bad. You have to watch this. So I finally watched it. and I'm like, oh my god. There's and another Netflix series called Devil in Ohio that's really good. I would recommend. Um, Emily Deschanel is in it, and it's like it's got a cult theme to it, but it's it's good, really good. I haven't Devil really in Ohio. watched anything lately. I've been rewatching Shorzy all the time. <laughs> uh, but it's spooky. I'm in spooky it's mood. It's spooky. It's, we're in spooky mode, so yeah, we totally. want to watch some found footage movies. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Conjuring was on last night. I watched most of that because I just happened to stumble on it. There's a, There is a... Is it a horror slasher called Escape Room? I haven't watched it yet. That's like a bigger name one. Mm-hmm. I watched one on Tubi that turns out it wasn't that one. It was oh. like a low budget crappy one. And I was like, that wasn't it's, that good. I think it's and called I'm... No Escape Room. Oh. Maybe. There's a couple Escape Room theme ones. Probably. Though. But do you ever do Escape Room? I haven't yet. Oh, I so would fun. love to. I they're think it would so be fun. so fun. They're so fun. The one in Mantowoc was awesome. We've been, I think, and then we, I think I said the Christmas one that is like their hardest one. The four of us got the best time, best nice. escape time. That one was just crazy because we had to get Santa's list. We, our, our goal was to steal Santa's naughty list. Mm. And we were sure it was in this grandfather clock that had like seven locks on it. So we had to find stuff, you know, like Miranda lifted up the carpeting and the carpeting you had to fold and it had tape that made numbers when you folded them together. Oh my gosh. I love stuff like that. For one of the locks. So we got, we got the final lock on the grandfather clock open with like 15 minutes to spare open the grandfather clock and then to pull the door open that had a whole second room behind it that we had to get stuff in mm. and we had no idea that room was there but we ended up getting like five minutes left so it was crazy but they're so fun that's one of the elements i love about video games like um silent hill there's always puzzles you have yeah. to solve yeah and, and depending on the level of difficulty you choose the puzzles are harder and also, and creepy nurse mannequins. Yeah. <laughs> and also, um, like, Skyrim, there's puzzles you have to solve yeah. in that, too. I just yep. like that. So yeah. it's like getting to do that in real life. Yeah. You're not playing a video game. But they're so fun. We should do a Strange Sessions escape room. That would be fun. That would be. I was going to say something more, but I couldn't think of what it was. <laughs> but anyway. Do we have a question? Book club. Oh, yeah. We were going to mention that. Yeah, we were going to mention that. When we're doing, you know, we do our break, our season break from the end of November until end of, end of January, January. But we're going to continue with the book club podcast because we can do that on Skype. Yeah, we're not going to do like an episode and then take a break. <laughs> yeah, we, we we don't have to be together to do the book no. club episode. So we can They're going to be short, 20, yeah, 30 we can, minute episodes. We can do that over Skype. So we are not ending that. Yeah, we don't want, it's not worth Kurt driving here in the snow for a 20 minute episode. So. No. Although if something happened, I would have my car on the side of the road and my footprints going into the woods and then I would just disappear so you could have something to talk about. do an about. episode on that. Do a whole series of episodes on what happened to Kurt. Finding Kurt. Finding Kurt. <laughs> but yeah, we're not going to stop with the book club podcast. So do we have any questions? I didn't look. Oh, I'll read a, um, what's his face? Chuck Norris, if I can see. Everybody knows I'm blind, apparently. <laughs> Chuck, Chuck Norris never hides. He only seeks. Wow. Chuck Norris is so smart. Stephen Hawking stood up to how... Oh, st- oh, that's terrible. Chuck Norris is so smart. Stephen Hawking stood up to bow down to him. Come on. Dang. Now. Ever see the Grand Canyon? Chuck Norris had nothing to do with it. He just went there once on a family vacation. What? I don't know what that one I don't get. Uh, nope. Me neither. Oh, my God. I'm doing one more so I can turn the page. Rather than being birthed 
Like a normal child, Chuck Norris instead decided to punch his way out of his mother's womb, hence the term C-section. Okay, I got a couple questions. That was terrible. Those were terrible. Really bad. Not as bad as the pickles. We might have done this one already, but I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, (laughs) somebody wrote in, what is the food that you would love to try? Durian. 100% durian for (laughs) me. I if we're going to love it. (laughs) Um, Hmm. Hmm. What is a food I would love to try? I think I would like to, tr- not. it's nothing specific, but we live in America where all cuisines that you try have been Americanized. I would love to try like authentic Italian or authentic Greek food or, yeah, you know I what think, I we mean? We did answer this one. I think you said Greek food. Probably. I think we did answer We it. do have a, a Greek restaurant in town that's supposed to be authentic, not like a family restaurant, like an actual Greek restaurant. I just haven't gotten there. I've had some Greek stuff, but I don't know if I would purposely seek out Greek food. Mm. I know you would. Yes. Uh, but would. the newest question we have, what are your honest opinions about living in Wisconsin? We're considering a move to Madison as we've only heard good things. We're Midwesterners to begin with, so the weather's no problem. I love it here. I love Wisconsin. I, I really think, do. I really, I think Wisconsin is a great state. I, I think the too. people here are amazing. Yeah. Stay out of Milwaukee, maybe. <laughs> well, Milwaukee's even nice. Like, uh, depends on where you are. Well, I'm not a big city guy, but I like Milwaukee. I feel comfortable in Milwaukee. Um... I love I love Madison. I I've only been in Madison again. a handful of times. I, Madison is a great area. Yeah, it's beautiful. But I mean, it's not perfect. It comes with everything. Like, does. Every, every yeah possible bad. But I mean, thing recreation. There's but so there's, many opportunities. There's a lot to do. Yeah, the people are great. Like I, I think I've said it on here before. I always remember. Um, Madison's probably a little expensive. I always remember but... the story about my friends going down to Arizona, and they went to a bar and ordered. The waitress came over and she was doing the samples of the test tube shots. Mm. And and they said, just put the tray down here. We're going to drink them all. (laughs) And she got to talking to them. And then after a little while, she said, what part of Wisconsin are you guys from? And they said, how do you know we're from Wisconsin? It's the accents. And she goes, no. She said, you're just nice. Uh She said, I took it. It was either Wisconsin or Minnesota. And I took a chance that you were from Wisconsin. That's so funny. And she said, and I've I've heard that from people Mm -hmm. that, that, they go to a store and they're talking to the cashier and the cashier says, you have to be from Wisconsin or Minnesota because you're so nice. We live you know, in, and that's, that's how we are. Yeah. We live in a state where you wave at people, whether you know them or not. Yeah. Like, or if <laughs> someone's up, just or how you, it is. Or you ope at someone if. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh you almost bump oh, into each other. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah. I did that the other day without even thinking about it. I was walking around the corner going to the coffee shop. Uh, Thursday night at Jen's to Jen's mm-hmm. to meet some of my teacher friends and I walked around the corner oh, and there were two people walking Jen. around at the same time and I was like oh, oh you know and I'm like oh dang it's so funny talk about being a it's, stereotypical it, Midwesterner it really is beautiful yeah here. Wisconsin I love Wisconsin especially 100%. the woods yes and Lake Michigan and we have all the seasons here and so but nothing's super extreme like Minnesota is way more extreme in the winter than we are here. I mean, yeah, it gets cold here. If, we if get you're, snow. If but... you're considering moving to Madison, do it 100%. Yeah, I, Although it's a I, nice area. Uh, my ex-girlfriend Jenny lives in Madison, and I went to lunch the other day with her sister and her sister's husband. And and what is the street in Madison that had like all the cool shops? Is it? The big oh, street. Oh, shoot. What State Street. Yeah. I was going to say State Street, yeah. but I thought it was another one. Like okay, when yeah. I've been in Madison, State Street has it's like all these, house. Like these hippie, not hippie shops, but like... There's it's like, like head shops. It's like, a, it's like the head yeah, shops. It's yep. like the real cool. It's where the college kids the college, go to but, hang out. But they said it's not like that anymore. They said it's like all kind of commercialized and oh. it's not like the mom and pop hippie mm-hmm. head shops. And That's the last that made time me I was sad there. Because like State Street is amazing. It was fun. But if you're thinking about moving to Madison, move to Madison. Mm-hmm. 100%. I love Wisconsin yeah. with all my heart. Agreed. I really do. Yeah, so me too. Go. I can't imagine living somewhere that didn't have the four seasons either. No. No. Like I have friends in Arizona and they put out like Christmas trees and it's like 95 degrees or Makes whatever. No sense it's just to like, me. Oh, a, no. a, a place without fall just isn't right. No. There. So come to Wisconsin, please. We're like so nice. <coughs> we are. Yeah. We are. We'll take you to Culver's. We'll take you to Quick Trip. <laughs> we'll wave at you even if we don't know you. You might somebody, have to drive around a tractor at some point on the highway. Whatever. I was going to post it in the group, but somebody had like, I think it was their engagement pictures on 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 facebook and one of them was wearing a culver's t-shirt one was wearing a quick trip t-shirt <laughs> they thought that was so cool because oh, those are the funny. wisconsin you know the standards. staples yeah the staples of quick trip and culver's but i think that is it they should listen to the podcast the cabin 
Yeah, listen to the podcast. If you're it's interested, so in, if you're interested good. in Wisconsin, listen to the podcast, The Cabin. Yes, I got Krista hooked on that. I love it. I'm uh, listening. I've, I just I've only to listened to the Quick one. Trip and the Culvers one. Well, the Chad Lewis is a guest on the yes, one of the paranormal I didn't listen ones. To that one yet. It's good. Um, yeah, they break down like what are the best uh, supper clubs? Yeah. Where can you get the best fish fry? It's it's really good. What every, are the best state parks? Every, every Friday, I I'm in a Manitowoc restaurants a Mantwalk business facebook page and every friday somebody asks who has the best fish fry because mm-hmm. that is a big thing here in oh front. yeah uh yep no i want fish but anyway <laughs> um so i think that's it yeah i think so so sorry deets. if this wasn't one the of the deets. better episodes but we had to cover dennis martin because he's a biggie and he is a gateway he's an for, og he's an og he is he's a gateway for people to find their way into the missing 411 universe which is how people often find their way here which is often how they find us yep. but lately there's like spotify is recommending us we just found out that we were like the, on bing if you type in paranormal podcast we are like the second one that comes up we're also on um websites that list the best podcasts i don't know how we end up on these lists but yeah. we are on these lists so obviously we they're not right listening. Obviously don't they don't listen to us. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so and all we have is podcasting strange to the world, and everybody else's description is yeah. like really long. Yeah, because you said we need, you said like, we need to you said we need you to may work on beef that. that up a little. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. We do what we do, which we'll is barely anything. Experts, <laughs> experts on the Maura Murray disappearance. <laughs> so and steak burritos. I think I think that's it from us. Please, please, please send us your stories mm-hmm. for the next episode. Yep. If you don't, it might be a really short episode. Kurt will give you the deets right now. So I will you give you the deets. <laughs> I got them right in front of me, as a matter of fact. Go figure. You can email us at thestrangesessions at gmail.com. We are on Twitter at Strange Session without the final S. Don't message us there because I don't think either of us look at that. No. We are it's on been Insta- years. We are on Instagram at the Strange Sessions where Krista does like just such a good job. <laughs> I want to hug her. <laughs> um, you can send our postcards and snail mail to The Strain Sessions, P.O. Box 434, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, 54221-0434. Maybe hold off on sending us any stuff right now because we are rapidly getting yeah. to the end of this season. Mm-hmm. So if you got something, durian, whatever, save it for next season. Otherwise, and, it's going to rot in my basement. We but you can call, and please, if you have any scary stories, you can call our phone number at 920-443-9602. Remember, you have like three minutes before it hangs up on you and you got to call back. But I can use... Just, whoa, Krista's throwing stuff around. Phone, but I can use some wizardry to stitch your story together, so oh, yeah. no worries there. He's an editing wizard. I feel like I have two or three things I was going to say also, but I'm completely blanking on them now. Also, just a reminder, again, if you have thoughts on the book... The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. Email the Strange Sessions Book Club. Is it the Strange Sessions Book Club podcast? Shoot. You should probably find out. I'm yeah. I'm gonna look, <laughs> I'm look gonna, right now. Like look that up right now. Hmm. My day quill is wearing off fast, is and it? we have a side sessions to do. Luckily, it's just us talking, which we can do. Let's see. Did I like put it somewhere? That would be helpful. Oh my god. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's the strange sessions book club at gmail.com. So please send us your thoughts. It doesn't have to be like a total book review. Just like tell us what you thought. And you can also call we would love to play your a voicemail about yes. the book review. We love voicemails. So call the hotline if whether you want to. Whether you're Kermit just... the Frog, whether you're a listener, <laughs> we love I would love to get one from the Cookie Monster. That's a request. <laughs> Cookie Monster would be good. Or Grover. Or Grover, yeah. Um, Elmo would be spectacular too. Or Bunce, wait, Beaker, Bunsen, Beaker. Goes, me, 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 yeah, me. yeah, I want a <laughs> message from Beaker. <laughs> um, Great. Yeah, we're starting to get silly. So I think we'll wrap this yeah, one we up. We're going to slide. We're going to move over to the next studio for couple the side sessions. A couple inches yep. to the left for the side sessions. So please leave us a story. And I think that's it. We wholeheartedly love you guys during our break. We're going to come to your houses one by one and hug you and tell you that we love you. Yep. And maybe we won't do that, but we'll see. In spirit. In spirit. We're gonna <laughs> we're gonna hug you in spirit. Remote we're gonna we'll get into remote viewing and we'll just show yeah. up astral projection. We'll astral project to your place and hug you. <laughs> yeah, weird. we're getting goofy now. Yeah, we're getting goofy. So thank you guys so much for listening. We love you. And until next time, from the strange seller, stay, stay strange. strange.